Hello and a warm welcome to ITV4's coverage of the brand new FIA Formula E Championship, the world's first fully electric racing series. 20 elite drivers will race through the heart of 10 of the world's most iconic cities and we'll be bringing you every single race live with the season finale right here in London. Welcome to the future of motor racing. Welcome to Formula E. Well, what a season it promises to be, and it's the iconic Olympic Stadium in Beijing, affectionately known as the Bird's Nest, that hosts the very first Formula E race. We'll be bringing you live coverage of the race in just over one hour's time. Now, joining us in the studio this morning is GP3 race winner Jan Mardenborough and Le Mans Audi race engineer Kyle wilson Clark. A very warm welcome to the both of you. Now, before we get chatting to the guys, let's find out why Formula E is so different and what we can expect. Formula E is a new FIA single-seater championship and the world's first fully electric racing series. The championship will compete in the heart of 10 of the world's leading cities racing around their iconic landmarks. The series, which climaxes right here in the streets of London, is unique in that it's a single day event. Practice, qualifying and the race will all take place on the same day to minimise disruption to the host city. A field of 20 big name drivers from 10 teams will compete in the series. Alain Prost, Sir Richard Branson and Leonardo DiCaprio are amongst the big names supporting the series. Spark Racing Technology, a consortium of highly respected motoring companies led by French racing team ART, have designed and built the cars which are to compete in Formula E. The all-important battery has been developed by Williams. McLaren were responsible for the powertrain. Italian firm Dallara constructed the monocoque chassis, whilst Michelin had designed the tyres with Renault, an expert in electric vehicles overseeing the system integration. During the actual race, charging of the batteries is not permitted. Instead, the drivers have two cars. They must make one mandatory pit stop in order to change over to their second car. For the first time in motorsport, exclusively created musical content will combine with close racing to give fans an unforgettable experience, whether they're at the track or watching from the comfort of their homes. Another unique feature of Formula E is that fans from around the world will be able to directly affect the race outcome. Voting for their favourite drivers will enable the most popular and extra boost of power. The three drivers with the most votes will each receive a five second power boost per car per driver, temporarily increasing their car's power from 150 kilowatts to 180 kilowatts. This extra 30 kilowatts is equivalent to an extra 40 horsepower. Formula E represents a vision for the future of the motor industry, serving as a framework for research and development around the electric vehicle and promoting sustainability whilst at the same time appealing to a new generation of motorsport fans. As for the points, fairly standard FIA procedures really. First place, 25 points all the way down to 10th place with one point. But the big difference with this pole position is three points Fastest lap, two points, and each driver drops one round score, but it cannot be a drop for a race exclusion. So, now you know all you kind of need to know, but guys, the most important thing to really discuss is why is Formula E going to be so exciting? Um, Carl, as a race engineer, what is it that gets you motivated about it? Well, the first thing is it's a brand new series. It's going to be completely new. We all don't really know what to expect from it. We've got fantastic drivers all around and it's in real tight, twisty city tracks. So, well, anything can happen, really. And as for you, Jan, driver list, the, the names that they've managed to get into this series, it's quite good, isn't it? Have you seen them and thought, yeah, that's pretty impressive? 
the driver list is, is crazy. There's a lot of XF1 drivers there, and uh, people like Bruno Senna, Senna, Karum Chanhook, and uh, people that are raced very high up in single seat as well, like Sam Bird. Uh, we've got a lot of sports car drivers there that have got a lot of experience. So every single driver on the grid is, is a very good peddler. And the environmental side has really attracted a lot of big players into it, the likes of Leonardo DiCaprio saying that he wanted to be involved because it is looking at future generation technology and all those sorts of things, which is, is really important, isn't it? Yeah, it's massively important these days. Everyone's looking at hybrid technology and sustainability for the future. And uh, this is a series that brings it really to the forefront of everyone's mind. And uh, it's good that motorsport is leading the way, definitely. And yeah, and we know drivers love a street circuit, but try and explain, because all of these races will be done in city centres. Why is it so much fun when you're a driver? Well, in a city, in, on a street track, there's, the concrete walls are very close to the track. Um, there's no room for error, so if you make a mistake, um, it's game over, really. And uh, for us as a driver, to uh, sort of flirt with the walls, it's very exciting for us, and it's, uh, it's a huge adrenaline rush. And um, yeah, for me, street, street tracks are my favourite types of circuits and, uh, yeah, the, all these guys are racing on them, so they're very, very lucky. The <laughs> whole race takes part in one day, doesn't it? You've got practice, qualifying yeah. and the race. Um, so that's going to be a real challenge, isn't it, for the teams to, if they have any problems early on in the day, to get it fixed in time for the race? Yeah, definitely. It means you need to come to the track prepared. You've got to make sure your simulation's good, so you come with a good base setup. You haven't got time overnight to really re-engineer the car. You've got the two practice sessions and qualifying straight into the race all in the same day. So you haven't got time to go home and sleep on it. If you made a mistake, you could pay dearly as well. So you need to make sure you don't damage the car and make sure it's there in one piece ready for the race. That's important. Yeah, yeah. Jan, I know you've actually been in one of the cars and we'll talk more about that in a little bit later on. But the sound of them, some people have been a little bit sceptical, but how do you feel about the sound? Pretty happy with it, both of you? For me, for an electric car, I thought it was going to be completely silent, but it actually sounds like a, uh, an re re electric remote control car. It's, uh, it sounds like that. It's a very high-pitched whine. Just have a listen now. You can hear it. You can hear the gearbox, in the individual gears. You can get to hear tyre squeals. So as a driver, you get to hear a lot more sounds that you wouldn't necessarily get to hear with a, a combustion engine. Does that so. make it more difficult to drive? It, it does, really, because as a driver, we usually shift gear with our, with our hearing. So you get used to the engine noise and you shift gear by just by hearing. And uh, with the Formula Eco, what I found, I had to sort of constantly look at the shift lights to, to know when to shift gear. So it's a very, very, it's a new experience anyway, but uh, I just found myself sort of hitting the limiter all the time, my head bobbing up and <laughs> forward. But uh, it's, it's a good, it's good. Now, fan boost, we have to talk about that a little bit. It's a way of engaging people who are sat at home at the moment, probably in their dressing gown and slippers, eating a bowl of cereal, thinking, yeah, I've, I've got a favourite driver and I, I want to interact with the series. What do you think about that? As a driver, does it make you nervous, thinking somebody else is a little bit in control of your race? It does, because uh, as a driver, you're in control. I like to be in control, but I am control my car. But with the fan boost, um, if I'm a driver in Formula E and somebody happens to pass by me, we're using their fan boost, and I'd feel pretty hard done by. So, uh, yeah, I mean, but it's, it gets people more involved with motorsport and uh, more involved with Formula E and, yeah, the public can have their say, which is, which is great. It's different. And um, car changing, that's another big thing, isn't it, that's totally new to this racing. So halfway through, there's a pit stop, they'll jump out of one car and into another. It's, I mean, it's that's pretty right. tough to ask them to do, isn't it? Yeah, they haven't got a huge amount of time to do it. It's uh, not normal for single-seater racing. Um, it's been done in the past, but that's been more when uh, a driver's been commandeering uh, his teammate's car, but that was many, many years ago. We see it now in Le Mans, um, but that's the same car, driver's changing. Here we've got it the other way around. So we've got same driver jumping into a different car. So we'll see how that goes. That's definitely going to be an important part as well, you need to make sure it's clean. Yeah, absolutely. Right, well, we will have plenty more chat from the guys coming up and we'll also have more build-up to the opening race from Beijing after the break and we'll bring you up to speed with this season's Formula E teams and drivers. Welcome back. 
A new dawn in motor racing is almost upon us. Beijing is the stunning setting for the opening round of the Formula E Championship, and the start lights go out in just over 45 minutes. Trackside is our roving reporter, Nikki Shields. Now, Nikki will be at each of the races this season for ITV Sport and has been soaking up the atmosphere ahead of the first race. Thanks, Jenny. Well, we've been fortunately blessed with a rather beautiful sunny day here in Beijing. And the Olympic Park has been spectacularly transformed. We're actually in the pit lane right now. You can probably see behind me, we've got the China Racing Garage, all the mechanics and engineers making those few final adjustments. We had uh, Nelson Piquet, one of the drivers out here earlier, also doing a quick interview. Now, Formula E has taken Beijing by storm. It's been amazing how everyone here has embraced it and uh, taken to social media to express their excitement as well. Plus, it's been across all the front of the newspapers. Got a great little feature here, actually. A uh, piece on China Racing and their driver, Ho Pintung, or one of their drivers, Ho Pintung. Um, but it really is an incredible atmosphere down here. Everyone's buzzing. We've had the Formula E EJ playing some music, and we just can't wait for that first race to get underway. Back to you in the studio. The feeling is very mutual. Uh, time now to take a look at who will be battling it out to become the very first Formula E champion. Here are your teams and drivers. German-based team Audi Sport Apt has secured the services of ex-F1 driver Lucas de Grassi. The Brazilian is certainly one to watch as he was initially a Formula E development driver. Daniel Apt, son of team boss Hans Jürgen, will do well to keep up with his experienced teammate. We came here with uh, the ambition to, to really do well and hopefully we're going to win the first race. Last minute replacement Takuma Sato finds himself racing alongside Britain Catherine Legg for the Amelin Aguri team. Sato steps in for Antonio Felix da Costa who has DTM commitments. Legg meanwhile clearly has been enjoying her time driving for the Japanese base team. We have a really, really fantastic team and I am excited to see how it pans out over the season because we're only going to get stronger. Frenchman Charles Peak joins Michael Andretti's Formula E team having only completed one day of testing. Andretti has also called upon the experience of longtime associate Frank Montani to race for his team in this season's championship. China Racing will have the advantage of a home crowd for the first race of the season in Beijing. Their driver lineup consists of Dutch born Ho Pin Tung and son of three times Formula One champion and an X1F driver himself, Nelson Piquet Jr. The Brazilian is looking to the Chinese fans to get right behind their team. First race is going to be our home race. I'm sure it's going to be a, a huge crowd and we're going to have a lot of support. Jay Penske's Dragon Racing team have had a late change in their driver lineup. Oriel Servia, who owns a stake in the team, has stepped in after Mike Conway pulled out. Belgian Jerome D'Ambrosio has been quick in testing and completes the Dragon Racing pairing. Edam's Renault run one of the most successful operations outside of F1. Coupled with the backing of four times F1 champion Alain Prost, they'll be considered a serious contender for the team championship. Cross son Nico will look to match the performance of teammate Sebastian Buemi, who's been the pre-season pace setter. We're both from the same region. We live very close to each other. He's a very good guy. He's been doing super well in testing, so it's a good reference. Mahindra Racing come to Formula E with a pair of hugely popular drivers. If you're looking for candidates to pick up a few fan boosts, look no further than Indian Karun Chandok and Brazilian Bruno Senna. The Mahindra pairing have also been consistently in the top six mix and expect strong points over the course of the season. It is one of those things that you have to look ahead, uh, a bit like the first cell phone. You know, everybody's like, oh, there's potential, but no one knew exactly how much, and now we have little computers in our hands. Jano Trulli has felt so passionately about this new fully electric racing series that he's decided to take the plunge and become a team owner. Trulli has hired fellow Italian Michaela Ciruti to partner him in this most innovative of racing series. Having uh, in the motor for the total uh, electric uh, single seat car, it's something revolutionary. We are green, uh, we are ecological, and it's a strong message uh, that we bring all around the world. 
Venturi certainly got everyone excited when Hollywood actor Leonardo DiCaprio announced that he was to become a Formula E team owner. The Monaco-based team boasts one of the most evenly matched lineups in the paddock. The versatile Stefan Sarrazin will be driving alongside F1 veteran Nick Heidfeld. Richard Branson's Virgin team have acquired the services of Jaime Algasuari, the Spaniard who spent three seasons with Toro Rosso in F1, has been paired with British driver Sam Bird. Bird has a history of doing well on street circuits and he certainly doesn't lack any confidence when it comes to Virgin's title credentials. Myself and my teammate Jaime should be and can be and will be at the front of this championship. I love that driver confidence from Sam Bird there, one of two Brits taking part in Formula E. Um, Jan, you know, as a GP3 driver yourself, um, how do you think the guys are feeling at the moment? Are they looking forward to it? Are they going to be nervous? What can they expect? I don't think... I don't know think uh, what the... I don't... Uh, yeah, I think what to expect. I think it's going to be a, a tough race for them. It's, uh, it's an hour race and 25 laps. Got to do a driver change, so there's a lot of uh, unpredictable, unpredictable things going to happen. And uh, the first corner at uh, Beijing is pretty tough. It's very tight. It's a tight right-hander, and uh, yeah, I think the race director is going to say to these guys, "Look, take it easy. It's uh, it's a long race." Carl, what, you know, what do you think as a race engineer? I mean, the guys have studied lots of data, haven't they? But um, when it comes to the drivers, is there anybody that you're particularly honing in on, thinking, "Yeah, they're pretty good ones to watch." Well, there are definitely, for me, two teams that stick out. Uh, the EDAMS guys have come very prepared. They look very strong. They've done very well in testing in Donington. And the second team is uh, Abt, Audi Abt. They've done very, very well as well. Um, inside of those two teams, for me, there are two drivers to pick out. Um, Lucas de Grassi, who's been doing a lot of development of the car with uh, Formula E themselves, and uh, who's been topping the timesheets a lot, uh, Sebastian Buemi in the EDAMS car. So I think those two are the ones to look out for at the moment. You spoke to Lucas de Grassi yesterday, didn't I you? Did. What in inside information did he give you? <laughs> well, he's saying that the circuit is very, very tight. Um, a mistake could really co cost you dearly. So that's the first thing. Uh, the curbs are quite big as well. So I hope there's no mechanical failures with that. Who are you picking out then, Jan? For me, I'm going to go with Hope in Tung. I raced with him recently at, say, in sports car racing at Le Mans. And, um, yeah, he's a very fast driver, very consistent, and uh, looks after the car. And, uh, yeah, that's who I'm backing for for the race. You're certainly going to have a lot of home support. You can guarantee that. Time for a break now. But when we return, we'll bring you all of the news from today's first ever Formula E qualifying session. Welcome back. So as Beijing waits patiently for the very first ever Formula E race to get underway in less than 40 minutes, we turn our attentions to the qualifying session which took place earlier this morning. So what is it about qualifying? Well, the drivers all go out, they have 10 minutes uh, to do the best lap they possibly can. Full battery power is available to them, which is around 200 kilowatts. Uh, the drivers are restricted to just one of their two cars though, and the pole is of course the fastest overall lap time, with three points being awarded to the person getting pole position. So let's see how they got on. In the first ever qualifying session of Formula E, four groups went out on the circuit with five drivers in each. The excitement and anticipation showed. A first group comprising of Chandok, Chiruti, Sarazan, Serbia and Truly all struggled. Ultimately, Chandok set the fastest time of a challenging first group. I'm the quickest at the moment, but uh, uh, I think I'd be surprised if we hang on to even to be in the top ten. The second group got ready for their turn. Britain's Sam Bird was joined by D'Ambrosio, Peak, Sato and Tongue. However, the careful preparation didn't help Hoping Tongue, who had this spin. Andretti's Charles Peak put in a strong lap to elevate himself to second position. Sam Bird now behind him in third. Chandok was able to relax as he remained in P1. A high-profile third group was expected to perform well and Degrassi set an early pole lap. However, he was then leapfrogged by Nico Prost. Daniel Apt, languishing in eighth place, needed to pull something out of the bag and succeeded, setting a new time to take him to third. In his eagerness to consolidate pole position, Prost made this misjudgment, but avoided any damage to the car. 
Group 4 featured two iconic names of F1 drivers in Nelson Piquet Jr. and Bruno Senna. The session couldn't have been worse for Senna. After being stranded in the pits, mechanical problems meant that he failed to set a time. France's Frank Montagny set fifth, but PK Jr. struggled to get to grips with the conditions. He'll start today's race in 10th place. The race is a different story, but already to get pole position is fantastic. Now we have a bit of time to focus on the race. Well, it seems like a very long time since Nico Prost, or A. Prost, was in pole position. I think it was you know, looking way back uh, in Japan in something like 63 or something. So it's been a long time, but Prost is definitely back in pole position and he will start this first ever Formula E race in number one. Alongside him, Lucas de Grassi will be in second and then Daniel Apt third. Uh, Karun Chandok did an impressive job there, managing to uh, get a fourth place start, even though he was in the very first group, which you'd think would maybe be a disadvantage. And Nelson Piquet Jr. rounds out the top 10. And if we have a look at uh, 11 through to 20, uh, Sam Bird, our Brit, uh, is in 12th place, struggling a little bit out there. Uh, and our other Brit is Catherine Legg, who starts in 16th place. Uh, and Senna having a really bad day, didn't he? In 19th position, he had some issues out there. Three cars not qualifying uh, and setting a time. Truly, Senna and Sarazan. So, a difficult time. And, Kyle, just explain to me how hard it would have been for the drivers and the engineers to go out and qualify today. It's pretty critical. Um, I think, from my understanding, you've only got really the one lap to get the optimum out of the car. Um, temperatures start to rise with the battery, so it's really key for the drivers to hit it really hard in the one lap and make it work. And you could really see some of the drivers pushing it really hard over the bumpy circuit there, and some guys having a few issues and a few lockups, as, as you saw there. Yeah, we can have a little look at some of the drivers now and the problems they had. Jan, talk us through this. What went wrong? This is, um, this is the, the quality of the circuit, isn't it, I suppose, because it's a street circuit. It's a very bumpy circuit, so uh, the road is obviously used um, in, for public use and uh, there's a lot of bumps in the roads and you have tarmac joins, so the driver's going to feel that. On a normal racetrack, it's completely smooth and uh, the struggles we have as a driver on a street circuit is um, it's not so much the bumpy, bumpiness affecting your driving, it's, it affects your eyes, your vision, your head's been bouncing around and uh, it's quite difficult and as you can see people hitting curbs. And, yeah, you uh, see the curbs are actually quite big here in the chicanes and uh, if you're going wide there it's really going to cost dearly and I think that's really important for the race. You can see quite a few guys going wide there, some being more lucky than others as you <laughs> that can see. That was such a near miss, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. So uh, for the race, it's going to be important to stay clean and, and make sure you make it to the finish. Definitely. How much overtaking do you think we'll be able to see in the race? Do you think there'll be chances for it? It'd be tough because there's a lot of chicanes and uh, a lot of the, the normal corners that aren't chicanes are very tight. The first corner is, uh, looks very interesting for the start of the race, considering how tight it is. But, um, yeah, I'm sure there's going to be overtakes and the fan boost as well. Um, hopefully we can see a lot of overtaking. I mean, who knows? Fingers crossed. Excitement is building. When we return, we will see how our very own Jan Mardenborough got on when he had the chance to test drive the Virgin Racing Formula E car. We'll find that out after the break in just a few moments. Hello, welcome back. The wait for the world's first fully electric racing series to get underway is almost over. The Formula E season opener is set to take place on the 3.5 kilometer Beijing street circuit in a little over 25 minutes. And don't forget, we'll bring you every race this season live here on ITV4. Now, outside of the 20 drivers who will be competing in the championship, there aren't many who can claim to have driven in a Formula E car. One man who has, though, is our very own Jan Mardenborough. Jan went along to Donington to put the new Virgin Racing Formula E car through its paces, and British driver Sam Bird was on hand to provide some advice. <laughs> This is a lot different to my GP3 car and I think this is a lot different to your GP2 car, so... Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very different to a naturally aspirated 
single-seater racing car, there's many other aspects to it. Are you using too much battery? Is the battery overheating? What do I need to do to recover some of that battery? Not only are you going to have to think about changing the brake bias, but you're going to be thinking about regens, you're going to be thinking about the torque modes, you're going to be thinking about the brake regen as well. So plenty of you to do. Just um, make sure you don't bend it. <laughs> oh, this is the weirdest sensation in the world. <laughs> oh, there's no temperature in the brakes on my days. <laughs> quite a lot of grip from these tyres. Feels quite heavy as well, the centre of the car. It's very... a lot of weight towards the rear of the car. It's very really difficult to to know to change gear because there's so little sound. You usually have the engine to tell you when to shift gear, whereas uh, you really have to concentrate on the on the shift lines, which is very unusual. Well, it's quite hot as well. I can really feel my back, the warmth from the I presume the batteries, the brake balance shifts every time you change a different regen map. So sometimes you have a lot of bias to the front wheels and then sometimes a lot to the rear. You can counteract that with the paddle. So the paddle, when you brake, puts more regen to the rear tyres. So if you lock a corner, we can pull the paddle and that sort of slows down, that slows down the rear axle. And uh, yeah, my experience in a Formula E car very interesting car to drive. How was it? Easy. Ace. Yeah? Really good. I push the canes quite heavy towards the rear, so it sort of like happened a bit of a moment for yeah. It's weird when you pull it changing down gears and you have to pull the paddle in. You yeah. try and turn into the corner if the paddle's still on it. Yeah. It's a bit it, it takes a bit of getting used to, but yeah. once you get used to it, you can use it to your advantage. Yeah. So I think it's a good tool. We yeah. see now the, the the battery percentage goes down yeah, quite quickly. It was, quite, it was like eight percent when I went out, and that was forty something. So it goes down quickly. Yeah, doesn't it it? You only did like three or four laps. Yeah. So Beijing, talk six for you, okay? <laughs> you come and do a reserve position for no us. No problem. Cheers. Thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, you can't go and do a reserve position because we've got you, so there. <laughs> um, how was it? Did you enjoy it? It was fantastic. Um, first time driving an electric car with gears for the first time and, uh, yeah, driving a Formula E car, there's a lot to think about as a driver. So many things you have to think about conserving the battery, um, the brake bias, adjusting the brake bias while you're driving. It's uh, quite a complicated car to drive and get your head around for the first time. Yeah, I think it's one of the, the series where a driver that's really thinking a lot and can cope about the different ways to, the car's going to balance. I think that's really important. Uh, a driver's definitely got his head screwed on properly. That'll, that'll go a long way. You'll help screw it on, <laughs> even if they're maybe not quite there yet. Um, you said about the feel of the car. It feels weird. Can you try and describe that to someone at home? Well, first I'm getting in it and you're pulling away. So all the racing cars I've drove, uh, you use a clutch obviously to pull away. Whereas this, you just have a brake and a throttle. So you're pulling away just using the throttle and it's just like, oh, this is really weird. It's, no, I'm not sort of having to stall the car or anything. So it's uh, very peculiar. OK, well, let's head back out to Beijing and join Nikki Shields. Uh, another one of our regulars is also alongside her this season. Mark Priestley is our other technical expert. Thanks, Jenny. Well, what a thrilling qualifying session. Jam-packed, so much going on. Had a few spin-offs and even some crashes, but at least one man kept his cool for one lap. Nico Prost, great to see him qualifying in pole position. But there were a few technical issues along the way, and uh, I'm joined by Mark to have a little chat about them. What happened to poor Bruno Senna? It was a real shame, wasn't it? Because uh, a lot of people had Bruno down as a favourite for pole position here, myself included. You know, he's out in the last uh, group in qualifying where so perhaps the, the circuit would have been in the best condition for him unfortunately right at the very last moment as he was about to go out uh, they found an electrical issue on the car and uh, it turned out to be something related to the battery we don't know much more than that just yet but it did mean they had to take the bodywork off the car do a bit of a system reset a bit like a control alt delete on your computer uh, and the thing came back to life but by that point it was a little bit too late and unfortunately he didn't get to set a time 
such a shame. It would have been great to see that uh, Senna and Prost battle out. Well, there still, still, still could be the opportunity to. Absolutely, too. yeah. Um, now, what do you think the guys have really learned today from free practice and qualifying? Well, they've learnt an awful lot. So uh, every time that the cars roll out onto the circuit here, they're learning huge amounts. You know, it's a circuit that nobody's been to. Uh, this is, these are cars that we haven't raced before. Uh, so for the drivers as well as the teams, they're collecting an awful lot of data. They're learning, as I say, every single time. So one of the key things about today has been getting as much time as they can on track. They've got to learn how to manage their, their energy, how, man how to manage the energy in the battery, how to cope with the regenerative braking systems on the car, as well as, of course, all the normal stuff like setting mechanically setting up the car for the race so a lot to learn yeah now you mentioned the regenerative braking there we saw a lot of the cars locking up i mean obviously they're trying to fine-tune that balance of getting as much energy from the regen as possible but that must be quite hard to do yeah it's really tough particularly in the formula e car you know we see regenerative systems on other forms of racing notably formula one um, but what's different about this and unique to the formula e cars is that they don't have the electronic control systems that formula one cars have so we don't have a brake by wire system meaning that the drivers have to do all the, the adjustments to the brake balance manually. A lot for the drivers to think about. It's a tough job. Now, immediately after qualifying, of course, they have to start thinking about the race. What can we expect today? Expect the unexpected. Uh, we really don't know what's going to happen, but I think it's going to be a fantastic race. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Well, I can't wait to see all 20 cars barreling to that first corner. Back to you guys. And neither can we. Some very interesting insight there from uh, Nikki Shields and Mark Priestley. Thank you to them out there in Beijing. But let us know what your thoughts are on the race on what is a landmark day of motorsport. Get in touch on Twitter at ITV Sport and you can use the hashtag FE. Nice and simple. So Nico Prost is in pole position and the fans in Beijing are out in force, all looking forward to the very first Formula E race getting started. Join us after the break for the season opener. Well, welcome back. And we'll be heading over to Beijing very shortly for the first fully electric race series as it lines up on the grid. Uh, guys, I just wanted to ask you, um, Nico Prost, is it a surprise that he's in pole position? Well, I did predict that either Abt or Edams would be up there. Perhaps I didn't get the driver right, but the team certainly was up there. So, no, not a big surprise. Um, they're well prepared. They're, they're a good bunch of guys and uh, they've come very well prepared. How much of an advantage will it be on a circuit like this? I think it'd be a huge advantage because it's a street circuit, it's very tight. The first corner is very, very difficult considering the amount of cars out there. So, uh, yeah, being at the front, qualifying at the front is, is key for single-seater racing and uh, especially on a street circuit, so you stay at all the trouble. OK, well, we are ready. Let's hand over to our commentary team for the season. Four times IndyCar champion Dario Franchitti. And first of all, alongside him is Jack Nichols. My name is Jack Nichols. Alongside me in the commentary box is three times Indianapolis 500 winner Dario Franchitti. Reporting from the pit lane, we have Nicky Shields and Dario after years of preparation from the Formula E team. We're about to go racing. Yep, this is uh, what it's all led up to right here. Who's uh, who's going to figure it out first? And, um, you know, they've got a race to come, but just to actually be here at this point is, is, is amazing. The, the, the time scale that this whole championship has come together is, is very, very impressive. And what a place and what a circuit to start on. We are here in Beijing in China, the capital of this magnificent country around the Olympic Park that hosted the 2008 Olympic Games, just 20 minutes from the likes of Tiananmen Square in the Forbidden City in downtown Beijing. There's a lot of 90 degree corners, there's a lot of chicanes, as is natural around a sort of grid system layout that they have here in China. But each chicane and each 90 degree corner brings its own different challenge that we'll get into a little bit later on. Three and a half kilometers and 25 laps await the drivers circling the bird's nest. It really is a spectacular venue for this race. And Certainly when we arrived here, Dario, the first thing you d say is, you know, wow, you know, it's 27 degrees here. The track temperature is 35 degrees. It's a beautiful day, clear blue sky. It couldn't be better. No, it really couldn't. Um, it, the weather has been very kind to us today. And it's, it is the perfect place for an electric vehicle race because with the smog you normally have here in Beijing, it's, uh, it's uh, been, been pretty, yuck, but we're very, very lucky to, uh, to have had a clear day and great track. Unusual in the fact it's anti-clockwise. 
like you say, the, the grid layout makes a lot of 90 degree corners, but each one of those chicanes is just a wee bit different. And um, they've been challenging this morning. All those gearbox uh, changes you talked about were due to uh, contact and some very experienced drivers having, having some issues there. So uh, it's, uh, it's a tricky old place and everybody's trying to still find the limits of the, of the car and the track. In fact, it was some of the most experienced drivers, Jano Trulli and Stefan Sarazan, who were some of the victims of that. There you can see on the pole position, the car of Nico Prost, his father there posing with uh, the boss of Renault Sports as they pose for a video. And there is Alejandro Agag, the CEO of Formula E, the man who has put this all together. And what a busy day and what a proud day this must be for him and everyone who's been involved with the Formula E project. They've had a lot of uh, hurdles to overcome, a lot of skepticism from, from motorsport fans as well and motorsport uh, employees. But it, it's all coming together and we are about to have a 25 lap street race here around the heart of Beijing, something which we didn't think would happen. And it was only the car was only launched a year ago and it was, it, you know, it didn't have a, a motor at that time. It didn't have batteries at that time. Everything was in place. But a year ago we were there in Frankfurt and it was just a vision of the future. There is Nico Prost, who will be starting on pole position just off to uh, the left of shot, getting into the car, putting his overalls on. And it was an excellent lap from Nico Prost to take pole. In fact, it would have been a, a, an even better second lap, but he put it in the put it in the wall. But nevertheless, a pole for him in the first Formula race. And he actually now leads the championship because he picked up three points for that pole position. Yeah, he did a very, very good job. He wasn't one of the fancied runners. He wasn't one of the people we kind of said, oh, he's, he's the guy to look out for. But he did the job, absolutely nailed that lap. And as you say, was on a better one, got a little excited on the breaking zone and uh, and uh, very nearly took the front wing off but uh, that, that, yeah I think he's uh, he's gonna be tough to beat now I think he's got this place figured out a little better than uh, some of the more fancied runners second on the grid will be Lucas Degrassi for the app team and there third on the grid will be Daniel Apt a little handshake with Jean Todd the president of the FIA who's wishing them good luck and Apt in second and third position is a really strong performance of them and there we see uh, Jean Todd making his way towards the front of the grid. No doubt to go and have another little chat with Nico Prost. As the grid starts to form here, that's the final corner. They come in from the right and into the hairpin left-hander. And then down to the start, finish straight. Well, one of the unique features of Formula E is that the fans have a chance to get involved with the fan boost system, uh, which gives five seconds of extra boost. And those are the three drivers experiencing it for the first time. Bruno Senna, Lucas Degrassi and Catherine Legg. And um, Kyle, how important is that they get one boost per car, two cars for each driver? Yeah, it's going to be important for the guys to use it at the right time. Um, it's really down to the driver in the car to, to select the best uh, time for Lucas that. On, yeah, uh, and if we just have a look at their starting positions, hopefully we can do that uh, and we can see how influential it may well be. The, the lead driver, I suppose, with that fan boost, Lucas Degrassi, where would you use that boost if you could? Well, if he gets a good start, he might not need it off the start, so he could perhaps save it for later on. Um, so we'll have to see how he uses it. And Jan, what would you do? If I was Bruno or, or Catherine, I would uh, definitely use it at the start of the race because uh, it's where you can gain the most positions uh, in the sh least amount of time. So, Bruno uh, Senna must be thanking his stars at the moment because starting this race in 19th place isn't too good, is it? But getting that fan boost is going to be crucial. It's definitely going to be crucial. And, uh, yeah, hopefully he can use it at the start and get some uh, really good overtakes and move up the grid. Our fingers crossed. We are just 10 minutes away from the first ever Formula E race live from Beijing. And you can see it's a pretty busy grid there. Look, Emerson Fittipaldi in the background. <laughs> seeing it but it's being the quickest you can using the minimum energy and uh, and managing that so it's a tough thing it's a completely different driving style required to do that especially with the regeneration units in the formula e car so uh, it's uh yeah i, I tell you, I'm, I'm excited about the whole thing and um i wonder who's going to figure it out first because there's going to be some tricks to this it's a very busy grid down there isn't it and we've got fans of uh, british drivers brazilian drivers but look at that what a what a view for the start line absolutely superb we can now hear from the president of the fia jean todd and formula e ceo alejandro agag they're both on the grid with nikki shields well, I'm joined by two men who have been pivotal in turning this dream into a reality. President uh, of the FIA, Jean Todd, and CEO of Formula E, Alejandro Agag. Jean Todd, what is it that makes this so special? 
new technology, you know, it's vision for the future. And we wanted to make uh, something with a different energy, which is uh, electricity. In the city, we are in the heart of uh, Beijing and uh, with a different uh, atmosphere, with a different uh, way of uh, communicating. And um, I must uh, thank uh, Alessandro and his team, the, all the FIA people who have believed in it and take uh, some risk to achieve today to be at the start with 20 amazing cars in an amazing city. And I wish really all the best with all my heart for this uh, new FIA championship. Alejandro, I know a lot of work has gone into it. This must be a very exciting day for you. Yes, it is. I mean, after all this work, finally what we dreamed uh, two years and a half ago is becoming a reality. I think having the first race of Formula E in Beijing, in the center of Beijing, sending a very strong message in favor of electric cars, of uh, to convince people to change their minds, their perception about electric cars. That's what we want to do. So I think if we're doing uh, we're doing history today in Beijing. Fantastic. Thank you both. And uh, I think we're about to go racing. Thank you. Thank you. Not far away, that's for sure, Nikki. Only about 10 minutes or so before the racing gets underway here in Beijing. And the great thing about the people that have put this series together is they are motorsport people. Alejandro Agag, he uh, formed uh, Barwar Adax, the GP2 team. He's been involved with um, deals in Formula One, Formula One television rights. It's not, uh, you know, it's people with a love of motorsport that have put this together rather than necessarily coming from the sort of more environmental side. No, absolutely. And you see that with the teams that are involved too. And you know, Jean Todd has, has obviously given it a lot of backing from day one. And, and he, uh, you know, there's not many people with a, a motorsport history like his from being a co-driver, Ferrari team owner, or team boss, you know, very, very impressive. We can go down now to the grid and hear from the supermodel, Bar Raffaelli, who is with Nikki. Well, I'm joined by the very glamorous Bar Raffaelli. Uh, we're also being told that we need to move in the pit lane. It's all getting a bit chaotic down here. Um, Bar Raffaelli, you're here at the first Formula E race. What do you think of it? I am so excited. I can't even tell you. I'm, I came all the way from Israel just to see this. I know it's going to be remembered for generations to come. And I just wanted to say I was in the first one. Well, thank you for making the trip here and hope you enjoy it. And we were at the first one too, Daria. We can say that. Absolutely. So uh, there you can see the grid starting to be cleared, all the VIPs heading back to the Emotion Club. And now we're starting to get back to the core of racing and we're starting to see these 20 cars. We can see the cars the again. Grid. Yeah, exactly. It was very busy down there, wasn't it? That's a great sign. And uh, it'll be Nico Prost on pole position there in the blue and yellow Edam's car with the all blue helmet alongside him on the front row of the grid. Lucas Degrassi just to dot a few I's and cross a few T's after qualifying. Frank Montani was given a three-place grid drop. He qualified fifth. He's been dropped down to eighth place for leaving uh, the pit lane before he was allowed to. And then Jano Trulli, Stefan Sarazan, Sebastian Buemi, Hope Tung and Michaela Ciruti all received 10 place grid penalties for uh, a change of gearbox. And uh, Mahindra Racing's Bruno Senna will start in 15th place just in front of those penalties because he failed to set a time. And uh, well, there's a, there's a very successful racer, Dario. There's a legend right there, Emerson Fittipaldi. He, uh, how does he look so good at that age? He is, <laughs> he, he's one of my heroes. What a, what a great guy. And uh, I, I know for a, a fact today, if he could, he'd be in one of those cars. He looks, uh, he looks better than you. He, he always did. There's the uh, Formula EJ who, who uh, keeps the crowd entertained here and provides Formula E with a, with a soundtrack in addition to the noise that the cars make. And you can see uh, an awful lot of people crowded over. They're going to have a great view of the start of this race. It'll take place just below them as they make their way down the start finish straight on Tianjin East Road. All of these are public roads that we're racing around. It may be around the Olympic Park, but some of them are very busy. And in fact, the final straight wasn't even opened until Thursday morning. And there's Nico Prost then sitting on pole position in the Edam's car. He won at Le Mans this year in the LMP2 class. He's a former Lotus Formula One test driver, former Euro Series 3000 champion as well. And although, as we said earlier, he wasn't many people's fancied racer, there's got to be something in those jeans. No doubt. Just look <laughs> at the, the view through the, the, the visor, the helmet. It just looks like looking at his dad a, a couple of decades ago, doesn't it? 
Daniel Apt starting third on the grid. The young racer who finished second in the GP2 championship recently. And uh, well, we mentioned Alain Prost. We can hear from him now down on the grid with Nicky Shields. Alan Prost, this must be a very proud moment for you. It's your team and also your son driving it. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure today. You can imagine, you know, he did a very, very good job. And the team was very strong. Unfortunately, we had a problem with Sebastian. But uh, so it gives us even a little bit more pressure. We only have one car, I would say, to try to win. But uh, we have done uh, we have done good. So there's no reason why should not be uh, should not be OK. It's a it's a big, big moment also for the series. So just cross a finger for everybody. I think that whistles for us. Thanks very much. Alain Prost, of course, also a four times Formula One world champion, ran his own Formula One team as well. And he's about to make his way off the grid as do the rest of the cars as we approach the start of the race. There's Karun Chanduk. He went out in the first group of qualifying and said, oh, I'm not going to be in the top 10. If I get top eight, I'll be over the moon. And he's going to start fourth on the grid. The Indian racer for the Indian team Mahindra. And great to have Karun on board. Even just to have him around is great, but as, he's, uh, as a racing driver as well, he's a very strong competitor, having raced in uh, at Le Mans as well, and also a couple of seasons in Formula One for a couple of different teams. And it's great to have him here. And he will start fourth on the grid. And then fifth on the grid will be Nick Heidfeld there, the German racer, one of the most experienced Formula One drivers on the grid, probably I think only uh, behind Jano Trulli in terms of Grand Prix starts, Nick Heidfeld as he sits there getting ready to leave. 183 Formula One races for Nick Heidfeld. He picked up 13 podium finishes in that time. And in sixth place, Jaime Algeshwari, the youngest ever Formula One racing driver when he made his debut at the Hungarian Grand Prix for Scuderia Toro Rosso back in 2009. So, I mean, every time we, we pick someone, I've got a different stat to read out about them, about three different stats to read out about them because they are so impressive. And it's such a strong grid as the grid girls now make their way off we will soon be getting the formation lap and the race underway here in Beijing around this three and a half kilometer circuit. There you can see the Andretti car on the left hand side. Four minutes to go until the start of the race. And it will be that man, Nico Prost, who will start on pole position here in Beijing. A beautiful venue here at the Beijing Olympic Park, a three and a half kilometer circuit going around the bird's nest there on the right hand side, the aquatic center there on the left hand side. The circuit's all well and good, but it's all about the all electric single seater race cars that are lined up on the grid for the FIA Formula E Beijing E Prix. We've just got minutes to go before the start of the race, and alongside myself, Jack Nichols, is Dario Franchitti in the commentary box. And Dario, it's, it's all come down to this, and, and finally, we're about to go racing. This is when it gets serious now. You know, we've done a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of there was a lot of um, excitement and a lot of questions. Was it actually going to happen? And here we are. Nico Prost on pole position. Then second on the grid will be Lucas Degrassi in the Apt car with his teammate Daniel Apt right behind him in third position on the grid in that uh, excellently liveried Apt machine. Used to be all red, but they got some Brazilian backers, which changed the rear colour scheme of that car. On the left hand side, there. Karun Chanduk in the Mahindra, the red, black and white machine from the uh, Indian car company. Then Venturi, the Monegas car company. A lot of experience in EVs for them and a lot of experience in motor racing for their driver, Nick Heidfeld. Sixth on the grid, Jaime Algeshwari for the Virgin Racing Formula E team. Virgin had a brief flirtation with Formula 1 a few years ago, but Richard Branson couldn't resist getting involved here. The iconic name of Andretti joins Formula E, and it's Charles Pick who will start at the wheel just in front of his teammate Frank Montani, who was given a three-place grid penalty for a pit stop infringement during qualifying. In ninth position on the grid, we have Nelson Piquet Jr., son of Nelson Piquet, and he starts in ninth for China Racing. Tenth on the grid will be Oriol Sevilla, the experienced Spanish IndyCar racer. He'll be lining up for Dragon Racing. Eleventh on the grid, Sam Bird for the Virgin Formula E team. Again, he's a very quick driver, finished runner-up in GP2 only last season. Jerome D'Ambrosio, another ex-Formula 1 racer, he starts 12th on the grid for Dragon Racing. Then it's the two Amni Naguri cars, starting off with Takuma Sato, a man with a huge amount of experience in Formula 1 and IndyCar. 14th on the grid will be Catherine Legg in the other Amlin machine. 
Bruno Senna didn't manage to set a lap time in qualifying, so he starts down in 15th position on the grid. 16th on the grid will be Michaela Ciruti. She had to change her gearbox after an accident in free practice. 18th on the grid should be uh, Sebastian Buemi there on the left-hand side in the next Edam's car. He was a very quick driver, but unfortunately had an accident in qualifying, meaning he too had to change a gearbox and starts right down towards the back. Stefan Sarazan there in the other Venturi car, and Jano Trulli at the back of the grid, not representative of Jano Trulli's pace. He too had a gearbox problem and had to start e right at the back. Seconds. There you can see the cars lining up. We go on board with Trulli as we get ready for the formation lap here in the FIA Formula E Championship in Beijing. Away pulls Nico Prost to start the formation lap here in Beijing. And it's all about to get real, Dario. Uh, to be fair to formation the guys at the back, the gearboxes were, were, were caused by crashing. Yeah. <laughs> That's where the changes happened. It wasn't a failure. Um, at this point, you've got to use as little energy, as little power out of the battery as you can on the formation lap while still warming the tires and the brakes up because everything you, you use here will be taken away for the for the rest of your stint. And so there'll be some careful uh, speed on this uh, on this warm-up lap. Yep, they do have, they uh, have been set a minimum delta time though, so they do have to go at a certain pace around the circuit as they make their way around now. We saw Karun Chandok getting a, a slow getaway, but he has managed to pull clear and uh, Stefan Sarazan at the back of the grid was the other man we were waiting to start the event. But the car's now winding their way through the left-hander and we go on board with Jano Trulli as he gets ready to pull off the line after Sarazan has got going again and starts to work up the heat in his tyres and brakes, most importantly, going down towards the first corner. And we'll have a look at this Beijing street circuit as we make our way around it. There you can see the we are right in the heart of the city. You can still see normal everyday traffic just going on under there. And then we come up through, that's the exit of uh, turn two at the top there. This is the chicane at turns three, four, and five, which is a, a very tight sequence of corners. And then we head up to a, a second chicane before we get to turn six, which is that left-hander at the top. And as we said earlier, okay, they're all 90 degree right-handers, uh, sorry, left-handers, but there, there, there is variance in them all. All of them seem to have a different element to them as Jano Trulli gets going. No, they definitely are. Each one's a little, a little bit different. The, the position of the walls the, the, and the, the, the chicanes in particular are all that little bit different. And there's that one chicane which would be turn seven, eight, nine that's caught everybody out. And uh, PK's technique was actually quite interesting. He went behind the curb and <laughs> used the grass a little bit. But uh, some of the other guys have, have been caught out by uh, jumping the curb a little bit and ended up breaking the, the back of the car on the on the wall. We'll have a 25 minute race. At some point during the race, the teams and drivers will come into the pits and uh, change cars. The drivers will hop out of their car and jump into the other car and get going again. But it is all under a minimum pit stop time so there is no advantage to be gained by how quickly you can change, but there's a lot of time to be lost. There is Aguri Suzuki, the man behind originally Super Aguri, and now the Amlin Aguri team, and they'll be frustrated with how their testing and season has gone so far. They're down in 13th and 14th position on the grid, and with Takuma Sato and Catherine Leg at the wheel, they, uh, I think they will be building through the year because they've got, you know, a really strong team there. I think they have, and they just were a little bit behind all, all through testing as well, and they're just trying to figure it out. Uh, so we'll, I, I think as, as this, the season goes on, they'll, they'll sort it out. But, you know, today with the way these cars race, you can win from the back as well, so it's not beyond the realm's possibility. Buemi, Sarazan, and then soon Yano Trulli. There is Hope in Tung, who had to start from the pit lane, unfortunately. He was the gap we saw out on the grid, so the Chinese driver with a pit lane starts. So we will have 20 cars out there. He was another man who had to change a gearbox because he had probably the biggest crash of all at the, at the penultimate corner. He did the front right and the rear right wheels in and must have damaged the gearbox in that accident as well. As that is the Hui Chong chicane. We're out at the towards the end of the circuit now. Just two corners left to go. The left-hander of turns 19 and then the left-hander at turn 20 bring us back out to the start-finish straight on Tianjin East Road. Well, 
There's been a lot of talk, there's been a lot of speculation, but now we're actually about to find out what an all-electric single-seater race is going to look like. History about to be made here on the streets of Beijing. Like any race, though, it's about getting through that first corner, isn't it? And that's uh, electric or, or, or powered by gas and engine. It's all about getting through the first corner before we can really get racing. And you know, these guys are going to be all attacking, I would imagine, at, at, at the start there. So uh, get ready for some fireworks. This is our on board with Charles Peak as he makes his way towards the final corner. Peak starting in seventh place on the grid. Before that, we had our onboard look at uh, Nico Pross, the pole car, and he's going to be looking back at the two apt cars behind. Jano Trulli has made it around and caught up with the drivers in front of him, so he will be taking up his place at the back of the grid, and that's a real shame for Jano because he was uh, looking pretty quick and he did well in testing as well, the Trulli team, despite a late start. There's Michael Andretti, the man overseeing the Andretti entry here into Formula E. And uh, do you think it's more nervous for him watching or when he was on the start line racing? Uh, I think for Michael on the start line racing, he took it very, very seriously. Uh, but as, as a boss too, he, <laughs> he put the pressure on. He likes to win. So pole position there on the right-hand side, Nico Pross for the first ever FIA Formula E race. The start of the championship begins here in China. That's Prost on pole position. Behind him is Degrassi and Daniel Apt in the two yellow and red Apt machines. Then it's Karun Chanduk there on the left-hand side in the red and black Mahindra. And that's the run they will have down towards the first corner. The two Andretti cars line up together on the fourth row of the grid. Charles Peak ahead of Frank Montani. In between them, there's also Heidfeld in fifth, August Schwari in sixth. A grid full of electric racers are about to go racing here in Beijing. And no clutch here. As soon as the, the lights go green, jump on the throttle and, uh, and off you go. So the stalling is, is not an issue, which takes... Uh, the cars are all lined up. The lights are coming on. And for the first time, we go green in Beijing. And it's a very good start from Nico Frost by the looks of things. The app drivers are coming with him on the way down towards the first corner. But it's Prost who holds the lead into turn number one. Around the outside goes Nick Heidke. He's got past Karun Chanda because they flash past the exit of the first corner. And then up towards the left-hander of turn two. Frank Montani makes a move on his teammate Charles Peake. And Peake's going into the wall almost. Not quite. A bit of contact in the middle of the pack. Bruno Senna's out of the race. His front left tyre has come off as they make their way now up towards the first chicane. But a good start from Nico Prost. He holds the lead. The two Andretti cars almost coming together, and it looks as though Bruno Senna is going to be out with that uh, broken front left as they wind their way. Now up towards turn six, halfway around uh, the opening lap pretty much, and Prost has done a good job to get away. A great start there from Heidfeld round the outside turn one. Oh, and they're all running very, very wide on that chicane. We saw Jano truly getting pushed back. It looks like he hasn't managed to get off the line, which is a real shame. Flashing now through the bus stop chicane and out towards turn 14. Absolutely nose to tail on this opening lap. Someone, I think, just cut across it there. Must have missed their braking zone. And there is Bruno Senna out of the race. And what a shame for him. He had troubles in qualifying, which meant he couldn't set a lap time. And now he is out on the opening lap. Ugh, devastating for him. He's had a tough day. He had all the pace to to, uh, to really challenge. Troubles as well for Hope in Tung at pit exit. Of course, this is all very new technology, very new cars to these teams. But in general, we've had a very clean start as we come around turn 19, back out onto the North National Stadium Road. And a whoa, big slide. I think that was Serbia getting it very, very sideways and crossed up coming into turn 19. He held it for the time being. But as we come through to complete the first lap, it's Nico Prost who is going to be in the lead of this race. As they turn through 19 and out onto the start, finish straight again. Nico Prost leads seven tenths of a second clear of Degrassi, apt in third. Great move from Heidfeld around the outside to take fourth away from Karun Chanduk. And then in sixth place is Jaime Algashwari. But look at that nose to tail behind. Nelson Piquet looking racy up behind Charles Peak. They're about to come upon the yellow flag for, uh, for Senna's car. And this is on board with Sam Bird as he exits turn number two and heads down the straight. That's Frank Montani in the Andretti car up in front of us. Bird not quite close enough. A little look from behind as we go back on board with Bird. Wow, look at that. So close as they come through the chicane. <laughs> I almost got him there. <laughs> to the left-hander of six. And the safety car has been deployed. And that'll be to uh, remove Bruno Senna's stricken car. So there's the uh, BMW i8 heading out onto the circuit to neutralize the race after 
uh, Bruno Senna came a cropper on that opening lap. Interesting to see who he hit because everyone else has uh, recovered reasonably well. As the safety car now pulls out, the rest of the cars will slow down. So there is the reason Bruno Senna's abandoned car. Back wing has gone inside. in it too. Yeah, so it looks not, like it. Not only the front, so yeah, it's obviously had some serious uh, contact. So the car is now under safety car conditions and they will slow down. And this is going to be interesting because this will allow them to save energy. And although this early in the race, they'll probably all have used a similar amount of energy. If we've got a later safety car, it might be a, a little different. But uh, nevertheless, it's going to give them a chance to push harder when, when the safety car yeah, comes in. Exactly. It just takes out the, that, that, that uh, part of the equation. It makes it less critical. So uh, they'll be going a little bit harder when, uh, when the, the green flag goes again. And there is Vicky Chandok on the left-hand side. Karun's father watching on as his son is in fifth place and his son's teammate is out of the race. There's Frank Montani in the white and blue Andretti car and they were he and Charles Peak got a, a little close for comfort. I thought they were going to run into trouble there at, uh, at the second corner yeah. and, and, and experience <laughs> Michael's wrath. They nearly broke the golden rule of taking your teammate out, didn't they? <laughs> that wouldn't, trust me, that wouldn't be good, Michael. Uh, <laughs> you would, never did that with him. Uh, maybe the once or twice. <laughs> I didn't mean to, though. <laughs> so there are the cars winding their way around to pick up the safety car, the BMW i8. And so we've lost Bruno Senna on the opening lap. Jano Trulli as well didn't get away, nor did Hope in Tongue. So uh, a shame we didn't get all 20 cars around the first lap safely, but on a twisty street circuit, I suppose it's to be expected that there'll be a casualty. We all got through the first corner safely, at least. And of course, Bruno Senna was starting from down in 15th on the grid. So he wanted to get going as quickly as possible. So here's a look at the uh, a replay of the start then. And off the start, Nick Heifert was really the man going into turn one that, that made the big moves. As they come down into the first corner, Prost got away well. Uh, Peak made a good start as well, but had really nowhere to go. Tried to look through the middle, but watch the uh, black and red Venturi car going around the outside of Karun Chandok at the first corner. And then at the second corner, really, well, there's a few things to keep an eye on. Here's Montani going up the inside of Charles Peak, which was very ambitious. Bruno Senna just got caught on the inside there, and he got collected. I think it was by Sato and uh, possibly D'Ambrosio in the Dragon car. Yeah, he got a bit ambitious, it looks like. Uh, he sort of halfway down the inside of turn two and uh, just made contact. So, yeah, probably nobody to blame there but himself I, on, first, on first look. And here's the look on board then with the 28 car of Charles Peak. So here comes Frank Montani, his teammate, up the inside. Oh, OK, are you going to give me room, Frank? Not much. Wow. <laughs> that was very close and a little bit of a uh, thanks for that. You'd probably keep your hands on the wheel, wouldn't you? Try and keep it out of the wall <laughs> rather than waving at your teammate. He can't see you anyway. He's, trust me, he's looking forward. <laughs> so there's Bruno Senna's car being recovered. We are on uh, lap three of 25 here in the first Formula E race. And there you can see Heidfeld has made up a position. Chandler has lost a position. Everyone else in the top six has remained at the uh, same level. Uh, Montani and Sam Bird made up three places actually at the start, going from 12th up to 8th position. PK Jr. and uh, Oriol Servi are both losing spots down to 10th and 11th. Stefan Sarazan going up to 14th place, having started further down the grid. And some of that because of the cars not starting in front of him and Bruno Senna's elimination. Sebastian Buemi is a man who didn't make much progress. He's still running second to last at the moment in 16th place. So I would have thought Buemi would have tried to make a bit more progress. But if you do, you end up like Bruno Senna. Yeah, after the day Buemi's had, he's probably taken it easy. <laughs> he's not had a good day. He's crashed two cars um, and, you know, accepted full responsibility. He just he's, he just made a couple of mistakes today and it's not like him. So uh, I think uh, it might be just taking it a little easy. So then... Bruno Senna's Mahindra has been hoisted up high and will be removed to the plentiful runoff on the exit of turn two as the cars continue around behind the safety car. All this time they'll be saving battery. It's a big test for these cars. You know, we've run a lot at Donington with the Formula E cars. This is the first time they've run on a bumpy street course, jumping over curbs, all that kind of stuff. So big, big test for the for the, all the components uh, the, today. It's it's going to be a challenge for them because the as the car is uh, was really designed and, and tested for, for road courses more than street, but this, so far they've stood up very, very well, unless they've been driven into walls, which yeah. uh, <laughs> any car's gonna break. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? This is the onboard view from Nico Prost, 
coming down towards the first corner. He got a, a good get away down into the first corner and Degrassi not quite close enough to get past as they came into the first corner. And that was actually a pretty good getaway from Nico Frost into the left-hander of two and then heading out onto the back straight. This one is on board from Lucas Degrassi and we'll see uh, Karun Chandok getting taken around the outside. So watch that black Venturi car of Nick Heidfeld very late on the brakes into the first corner and he's got the bravery to go around the outside at the first turn and move up into fourth position. Good work there from Heidfeld. Yeah, crack and crack and move there, perfect. It's great to watch the instant torque of the old electric motor, isn't it? Yeah. It just goes. Yeah, it's a pretty instant getaway. This one is on board with Charles Peak. We've seen him uh, coming together with uh, Montani already, but he seemed to, he positioned himself sort of in the middle. He had to get out of it there, didn't he, really? To, oh, and he had someone on his inside as well. So Frank again. <laughs> yeah, was it, oh, Frank on his inside and then went to his outside. So that was uh, very desperate to get past there, Montani, and assert his uh, authority as perhaps the more experienced <laughs> driver in the team. Yeah, he definitely did there. That was a close run thing. This was on board with Jano Trulli, and that's what happens when uh, you don't quite manage to get away off the start line, and that's real frustration for Jano, the medical car pulling past. But there's our race leader, Nico Prost, with a very clear visor, actually. Most most drivers, I think, tend to sort of go a bit more tinted, don't they? Yeah, especially at this time of day, as the sun's going down a little bit, that could cause some issues in uh, some of the directions. So in the race, these, these cars, which have uh, 200 kilowatts of power in qualifying trim, which is equivalent to 270 brake horsepower, they run lower than that during the race, a maximum of 150 kilowatts of power, which is equivalent to 200, to 200 brake horsepower. The fan boost gives them a 30 kilowatt boost, which again is equivalent to 40 brake horsepower. So I wonder if we might see some people using the fan boost off the restart. It's Lucas Degrassi, Catherine Legg, and Bruno Senna that have them. Senna probably won't be in a position to do it, <laughs> but Degrassi, if, if Degrassi is close enough to the back of Nico Prost, he might have a chance of uh, using the fan boost and getting past. Yeah, first safety car, how is it going to work? When, when, when is Prost going to go? What's it going to look like? Um, yeah, Degrassi might just jump him. It'll be, be good to see that. Um, it's definitely going to give him an advantage. It's a big percentage power gain, isn't it? Yep, absolutely. An extra 40 brake horsepower for five seconds on each car. It's good to see so many fans out in attendance here in Beijing. It's not good to see Bruno Senna walking away after a first lap incident. He tries to find his way back to the paddock in what is a, a maze of a street circuit winding around the Olympic Park here in Beijing. We are on lap four of 25, still behind the safety car, but I don't think for much longer because the car appears to have been cleared. So fingers crossed we may get the safety car back in this lap as Alain Prost watches on as his son continues to lead the race. The safety car will be coming in this lap, so we'll be going green again in Beijing before too long. This is the view from on board with Nico Prost, with Lucas Degrassi right up behind him and showing himself in the mirrors there. He's getting close. One of the keys here, we talked about Orm in the tires, up, Orm in the brakes up to carbon brakes on the, on the Formula E car, and they're quite difficult to get the temperature in, so we're going to see the guys really try and get those up to operating temperature before the, uh, the safety car goes in. It's green hand up. Coming in fifth place, Jaime Agashwari there in sixth in the Virgin car. Frank Montani seventh, Sam Bird in eighth. Ninth place for Charles Peak. I the top ten at the moment is Nelson Piquet Jr. The point scoring system is the, the standard FIA system with uh, 25 points for the win, all the way down to one point for tenth position. But there's also two points to be gained for setting the fastest lap of the race. There's the message from Race Control. Safety car in this lap and we'll be getting racing again. This may, we may see cars being pushed a little bit later into their stint because they'll have more battery. And we may see cars running at a higher speed and still coming in at the same time. It's going to be very interesting. Yeah, it might open up a bigger window for the, for the strategies, and um, which will make it more interesting for, for everybody watching at home exactly what, uh, what goes on there. I think Hoping Tung has made it out of the pit lane and onto the circuit. I think he might be a lap down, but he is still out there on track. So we've got 18 cars running as the safety car will come in. They're coming up towards the penultimate corner now. This is the Kui Chong chicane on the Hu Ching Road. As we come up to the penultimate corner of turn 19. And at some point, Nico Prost will decide to floor the throttle, use all that torque. He'll probably turn it up to 150 and get racing underway again. He's when he have feels to, appropriate. Because Lucas has got that fan boost, so. We'll wait and see when Degrassi decides to use that fan boost as they come down towards the final corner now. Prost checks his mirrors. There he and goes. there he goes. He's 
got on the throttle and he's tried to pull away as much as possible from Degrassi. We go green again here in Beijing. Nico Prost leading the way. Lucas Degrassi in second place. It's third for his teammate Daniel App, and it's fourth place uh, on the road for Nick Heidfeld. That's Hopin Tung moving to the inside line and trying to get out of the way of the cars behind because he is a lap down, but he had to happen to come out in the middle of the safety car period. So we're racing again on lap five of uh, 25, 21 laps to go then. Montagne's looking racy. He is, isn't he? He is uh, right up behind Sam Bird as they come down into the chicane. Bird goes defensive. He needs to be careful because Hopin Tung's in there. Montani won't be able to get around the outside. And uh, sorry, it's Montani behind Algashwari with Sam Bird behind him and then Charles Peak behind him. So Virgin Andretti, Virgin Andretti uh, for sixth to ninth positions. Lining him up here for a move. Down into the chicane. A little bit wide there for. Hope in tongue, but he keeps it all together. Winding through the second chicane, the bus stop. And Montani is right up behind Jaime Hagashwari. They're all so close to one another, aren't they? He's weaving the boat a lot, but he hasn't made the move yet. He's, he's wasting a lot of energy doing that. Um, this has set him up, which he might have just done right here. Out into 14, out onto this long sort of straight. And here we can see the graphics up in front of us. But look at the move up the inside, coming down into the... Uh, <laughs> bit of a block chicane, yeah. <laughs> Not able to quite get past. We're on board with Sam Bird, and that is Montani trying to get past Algashwari going into the Huayong chicane. And now he's going to look to the outside, to the inside, but Algashwari is covering his line, and Montani goes to the inside, locks up, and gets past. And that's going to allow Sam Bird to get through as well on the exit of 19, going side by side with his teammate down towards the left hand hairpin, and Algashwari will have to uh, yield this position, surely. And this could compromise Charles Peak, and here comes Nelson Piquet Jr. up the inside, all trying that that final corner is so tight. There's no way you can go through there side by it's side. It's so inviting to do it too, and that heavy braking zone, and you think, okay, here we go. And then it tightens up in a hurry. It's good racing right now. Nico Prost has a second advantage. Here's Servia going past Nelson Piquet Jr. into the first corner. Takuma Sato is involved as well. So that's Servia taking 10th place away from the Brazilian. PK Jr. holds his nose on the inside. That could give Takuma Sato the advantage because he took more speed through that second corner as they come out onto Tianchen West Road, down towards the chicane, and Sato follows through then. And so Sato now takes 11th, Serbia's in 10th. Nelson Piquet goes from 10th to 12th in the space of two corners. Nico Prost up at the front has a 9 tenth of a second advantage. And someone has uh, collected something out there. It's the back uh, wheel cover of one of the... One of the cars I wonder if there. it's Nico Prost, you know. It looks, it looks like, yeah, it, it could looks be or e one of the empty cars. Or is it an Amlin? Here we come, through we go. Oh, it's just, oh, it's come off the back of Buemi. uh, Buemi's car. And so his, I wonder if Buemi, wings just fail too. I wonder if he's had a bit of contact out there that's that's loosened it. Yeah, it looks like it. That's, that's what it looks like, and it's taken the wing with it. That's unfortunate. So I thought for a moment it was going to be Nico Prost, but it's still Prost leading the way. Only a second ahead of Lucas Degrassi in second place. Third place, a further 1.6 seconds back is Daniel App. There you can see the standings down at the bottom. And there you can see that's the percentage of uh, battery remaining. So we saw in the early stages they had 85%. They're now down to 63%. And when, obviously, you get approaching 0%, that's when you want to come in and uh, and change your car for your second one that's waiting in the pits. So we can see who's used more battery than others, which is very interesting. Here's a look at the inside from Serbia, but that's just him lapping uh, Hope in Tongue. Nelson Piquet Jr. is trying to get back past the Kuma Sato. That's getting tight in there. They're yes, still going go wheel to wheel. Side by side. Yeah, absolutely. We were wrong about that one. Sato will have the inside line down towards the first corner to start lap seven, and Sato will... Oh, not quite hold on to the place. PK goes all the way around the outside at the first corner, down towards turn number two. And PK gets the job done, so he holds on to that 11th place for the time being. That's a good race, and really nice. They, they gave each other some room there and didn't uh, needlessly uh, break some stuff. And all this has allowed Jerome D'Ambrosio in the silver dragon racing car to come into the fight as well. Uh, all in the middle of that still, we've got the Team China car of Ho Pin Tung trying to get out of the way of these guys, because he is running a lap down, down in 18th place. Sebastian Buemi has come back into the pits after that damage to his car. The top three cars, meanwhile, only covered by two and a half seconds, so difficult to know where to look at the moment as they flash out of turn 14, out onto Huching Road once more. It's clear that Prost using a little bit more energy staying ahead there. 
and will that come to affect it towards the end as he sort of taking some out of the bank right now uh, who, who knows it's all unknown it's all the uh, it's yeah. all new isn't it absolutely and even all weekend we've been asking the teams what are you going to do and a lot of the time they're not quite sure what the best strategy is until they've done a couple of proper races yeah or either that they don't want to tell us this is on board with nico frost you can see the kilowatts he's running at on the right hand side so as he's braking the green regen flashes up but then on that tower when he gets back on the power you'll see it go up and crest to 145 kilowatts he can use a maximum of 150 so he's saving a bit of energy at the moment obviously you've got the kilometers an hour in the middle there and you can see 53 percent battery uh, remaining and that's just like any battery powered thing. You've got 52% remaining. So when you get down towards zero, you've got to come into the pits. You've also got the, the brake uh, pressure coming in there, the gear that they're using, uh, and of course the throttle application and speed as well. So hitting 160 kilometers an hour before he turns into the first chicane on this three and a half kilometer Beijing circuit. And Lucas de Grassi is sticking with him about a second behind. Through turn six, they're starting to drop Daniel lapped a little bit, Lapp closed in on that last lap, but it's 2.3 seconds now between first and third. The quickest man out there actually is Frank Montani. He's just set the fastest lap of anyone, and he's closing in on the back of Karun Chandok, who's right up behind uh, Nick Heidfeld. So there's Heidfeld and Chandok, and there's the fastest man on the circuit, Frank Montani, flashing through. I wonder how much uh, energy and how much he's got, Frank's got it turned up because he is catching. You know, he's blown by a bunch of cars and uh, he's catching the guys ahead of him. That turn nine chicane, every time you see a car go through there on the exit, it's right on the limit. Trying to fix Sebastian Buemi's car. And Buemi, I suppose, uh, one of the favorites of the championship, but master of his own downfall today to, to, to crash the car in both free practice sessions. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody has a bad day, and he, he definitely did today. So um, I think we'll be going back to, and regrouping, but the other Edam's car leading the race with Nico Frost. So, uh, you know, good and bad today for the team. All on the shoulders of Nico Prost at the moment then. Frank Montani is bringing Sam Bird with him, actually. Sam Bird is lapping at a similar speed to Frank Montani in front. So those two might be coming together to join the battle in the back of the pack. We saw a very close pair there, and it's uh, Nelson Piquet and, again, Oriol Servia going side by side into the final corner. Piquet gets it done on the brakes. Good work from uh, Piquet Jr. And that moves him up uh, into 10th position again. As they come across the line, you can see PK Jr. has used slightly less battery power, but when it's within 1% or 2%, it doesn't really make a huge amount of advantage. But again, Frank Montani, the quickest man on the circuit. I wonder if Serbia got a little bit excited as if early laps and used a bit too much, and he's having to pay the price now and just back off just a little bit. 17 laps to go. We're on lap 9 of 25 here in Beijing. The first ever all-electric single-seater race around the streets of Beijing, around the Olympic Park venue for 2008. As they come down towards the chicane, there's the bird's nest on the left-hand side. And Takuma Sato is now the man who's right up behind Oriol Servia. And out of the pits comes Sebastian Buemi after picking up that rear wing damage. And he's gonna head back out onto the track because, uh, well, he doesn't have a fan boost, but if you set the fastest lap of the race, you can get a, an extra two points. So it's worth going out there and, and trying to do that. I think right now he'd take any point he could get. Uh, incident involving uh, Bruno Senna and Takuma Sato under investigation. So we saw them coming together at the, uh, at the second corner. And so that will be investigated by the race stewards. And here is Sato still up behind Oriol Servia, winding through the Hui Chong chicane and out towards turn 19 once more all running line astern, but it's really closing up for fourth place behind Nick Heidfeld with Chanduk, Montani and Sam Bird all coming right with them. So that's going to be a very close squabble before too long. Down towards the final corner, and PK Jr. has just made a bit of a gap now. This is probably the most consecutive laps they've run on the track. Um, and you're going to start noticing things, the way the tyres wear, the, the way your temperatures are building, all that kind of stuff. And I wonder if they're making adjustments to tyre pressures on the second car. Yeah. Um, because of that, and they'll, they'll now realise, OK, the setup we chose is a little too aggressive or it's like starting to actually come into its operating window. On board we go with Lucas Degrassi looking back to his teammate Daniel Apt right up behind. In the top three right together. We always thought Edams and Apt would be two of the strong teams and it certainly looks to be panning out that way with Nico Prost leading the way. But then that queue behind for fourth place is really starting to 
to uh, come to fruition. Here come the leaders then. Cross, Degrassi, Apt, flashing through the bus stop chicane and down towards the left-hander. This is where the circuit gets really narrow and then widens up a little bit again and probably out onto the widest part. Yeah, that that, uh, that area there turned sort of 13, 14 is unbelievably narrow. And if we walked down there yesterday, I thought we'd gone down the runoff, <laughs> but by mistake. And uh, being narrow like that, very, very easy to make a mistake. 16 laps to go, and Karun Chandig is starting to have to defend because Frank Montani has caught the back of him and is looking very racy in that Andretti car. Let's have a look. So uh, Chandig has 33% of battery remaining. Montani, according to this, has 65% of his battery remaining. So uh, I think that might be an error. Yeah, we'll see whether uh, that turns out. He is lapping very, very quickly, but uh, it'll be interesting to see whether that is accurate at this moment in time. Here comes Montani into the final corner, looks at the inside of Chanduk, gets it on the brakes. Chanduk sees him coming and has to turn in very, very late in the day, floors the power, and that is Frank Montani through up into fifth place. Another great move by Frank there. We knew he was going to be aggressive, and uh, he's definitely living up to that. He's done a, a great job getting up there so far through the first corner as we go on board now with Sam Bird who's the next man to try and pass Karun Chanda into the left-hander that takes them out onto Tianchen West Road towards this first chicane at three four and five a little nose to the inside nothing doing just yet I think what we're seeing from this is the cars can run very very close together which is great for racing uh, they're not getting a massive draft from the car in front but the because they can run so close together, you're not getting the normal aerodynamic wash that you would get. Oh, and there's Takuma Sato on the exit of the first corner. The Amelin Aguri car has ground to a halt, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully, he may be able to get that going again. The Japanese driver, who was a very late addition to the Amelin Aguri team, he tested for them a couple of times, and of course, was with Super Aguri in Formula One, but they weren't expecting him to race until the very last minute. Yellow flags out at that first corner. It's really starting to close in for leading the race now. Just 1.3 seconds between Prost, Degrassi and Apt. Yeah, it looks that Lucas is, is catching him and Apt's catching Lucas. So we get ready for uh, some excitement here, I would say. Um, it's, I think it's when you want to pounce, isn't it? Yeah. That's the thing. When do you want to use that extra bit and, 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 and pounce on the guy in front? On board we go with Hope in Tung in the Team China car been put together by Mr. Stephen Liu and it's great to have Team China here and uh, Hope In a very experienced racer, very quick racer as well, 2007 German Formula 3 champion before moving on to GT Racing, other single-seater race series as well and it's such a shame that he hasn't quite been able to, well, he's been able to perform, he's got the pace but it was just that accident in the uh, free practice session combined with uh, the gearbox problem is a real shame. Sebastian Buemi, as we suspected, has just set the fastest lap of the race, so that's potentially two points in the bag for him. I think he's probably got it turned up to 11, hasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's not caring about, you know, running uh, X amount of laps, now he just wants the fastest lap because he's, he, he's not going to figure in the, in the main result. It's good that you're hoping Tongue's out there because he is the local favourite and mm. good to actually get the car on track despite all the, 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 the tough things that had happened today. So it's very interesting the toing and throwing up at the front because all of a sudden the top three have spread out a bit and Nick Heidfeld is coming into the fray. It's one second now between every car from first down to sixth as Chandler goes a little wide coming through the bus stop. And Here comes Frank. Yeah, exactly. Frank's coming to join the party in fifth place, closing in on Nick Heidfeld. We're on board with Sam Bird in seventh position, runner-up in GP2 last season, and he's trying to get past Karun Chandler in front. The Virgin cars running seventh and eighth here, fairly uh, closely tied in speed. Yep, Jaime Algashwari is uh, he's four and a half seconds back at the moment, so we'll be running a bit of a different energy mapping strategy. Prost looks like he's looking in the mirrors a lot. I think he's just managing the gap. It looks like that's probably what he's what he's up to there and just trying to keep Degrassi just to set a sensible distance back. Fastest middle sector of anyone for Frank Montani in the Andretti car. So he is continuing his really impressive pace to join the back of Nick Heidfeld up in front of him in the battle over fourth position. So it's Heidfeld in that black and red Venturi machine. Frank Montani behind in the white and blue Andretti car that turns into the first corner. Still Takuma Sato's car uh, being recovered out there. 
And we've got one person into the pits. So that's Stefan Sarazan, I think, going into the pit lane. Yes, and Jaime Algashwari. So both of those guys coming in reasonably early, considering they uh, they haven't necessarily had that much pace. Yeah, they're going to try the undercut, try to do some sort of strategy, aren't they? But that makes that last in the race a wee bit long, considering they've had the safety car uh, lengthening the, 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 the first in a wee bit. There we are, the cars winding through that tricky chicane. Frank Montani right up behind now. Buemi's under investigation for something. OK, so Sebastian Buemi under investigation, but he is down in uh, 18th position at the moment, so it's not going to affect the outcome of the race as it all starts to close in again between Nick Heidfeld there in the black and red Venturi car and the purpley pinky helmet of Frank Montani behind. Still up in the lead of the race, it's Nico Prost with Degrassi and Apt in second and third. And how soon will it be before an attempted pass comes from Frank Montani? Not long, I'd imagine. I think if you, if you pit early enough, you can turn, if you've got a little spare left in the battery, you can turn it up for that last in-lap, which is maybe the advantage to pitting a wee bit early rather than, than running it uh, you know, all the way dry. So here is Jaime. He has been in and changed his cars, and he's letting out the pits now. Frank Montani right up behind as they come down towards the final corner. Into the pits comes Nico Prost. The top three coming in. Montani decides, oh, I want to go in the pit lane as well. Ooh, he and dives in trouble. at the last minute. Might be in trouble for that. He was on the wrong side of the line. So that means Sam Bird moves into the lead of the race as the pit stops begin. It's about to get busy in there. At the uh, halfway point in the race, Sam Bird now is out in the lead. So now it's all about, well, it's a minimum pit stop time, but also they need to be careful about unsafe releases as well. That's going to be the thing. They, there'll be a man with a stopwatch there. You can see on the left-hand side, he'll tell them when is the appropriate time to leave the pits. But if there's cars coming, then they need to be careful. No, oh, absolutely. And the guys have got this time now. They know how long it takes them to drive down there. They're obviously timing the whole uh, the, the, the pit stop, the, the car change, as it were. And, um, but a car coming out from a competitor at the wrong time can really mess things up for you here. So there's Nico Prost getting strapped in. He was in the lead of the race with Degrassi behind and Daniel App in third position. That was the order. Now we've got third and peak out there. It's Frank Montani getting strapped into his second machine. Out of the pits there. I think that was Nico Pross. As yep. we look at the pit lane exit, is Pross still out in with the advantage? Into the pits comes Catherine Legg. Here now That's is Prost. Nico Pross. He's got Nick Heidfeld behind him, and the app guys are coming out behind. So that's Lucas Degrassi coming out just behind Nick Heidfeld. Then it's going to be Frank Montani. Then it is uh, the other app car of Daniel Apt. And then out of the pit lane comes Nelson Piquet Jr. So Sam Bird is in the lead of the race. And is this going to be a different strategy, just one lap different perhaps to get a full power lap in on your in-lap? That's going to be very, very interesting to see. He's pushing like hell. But here's the thing now, if you pull out of your pit stall and then you slow down to do the minimum time mm. and hold the rest of the field up, you've uh, gained that's an advantage. That is, that's a very good point, actually, and that might be why the Venturi car was going a little slow in the hands of Nick Heidfeld, just trying to gain that track position as the cars filter their way out of the pit lane. Catherine Legg now heading out onto the circuit. Sam Bird comes in then to do his pit stop. So let's see where he comes out. He was running down in uh, sixth position when they came into the pits. And it'll be very interesting to see where he comes on the way out. What was his uh, in-lap times like? Not particularly quick. So he certainly didn't go for it on his in-lap, should we say. But it is still Nico Prost at the moment who is in the net lead of the race in the Edams Cup. It depends where the timing line is as well, doesn't it? Yeah. If it's halfway down the pit lane, he's going to have been on the, the speed limiter for quite a while. But Nico Prost has got a good old lead now. Yeah, the Edams team have done a very good job to get him out with a, with a strong advantage. And a, a drive-through penalty has been given to the number nine car of Sebastian Buemi for crossing the pit exit line. So when Buemi's day couldn't get any worse, here comes Sam Bird then. He's heading out of the pit lane now. Our race leaders are just up in front of this group. It's Nico Prost. There he is in the Edams car. So it's a battle between he and Sam Bird. It's one of those two who are going to come out in the lead of the race, unless Charles Peake has done something spectacular on his in-lap. And here is Prost coming down towards the final corner, the left-hander. Turn 20 on the circuit. 
accelerates through, gets on the throttle onto Tianjin East Road, and he's going to retake the lead because there's Sam Bird in the pit lane on the right-hand side. So Nico Pross retakes the lead of the race. Second place then, that's going to be the interesting battle. That's a backmarking car of uh, Sebastian uh, Buemi that's up in front of Nico Pross. Then we've got Heidfeldt in second place. Then we've got Degrassi in third, Montani in fourth. It's fifth for Daniel Apt and sixth place for Sam Bird. So he didn't really lose or gain by taking that pit stop strategy, except maybe avoiding the carnage in the pit lane. Yeah, avoided a bit of carnage. Now we can also turn that up a little bit because his last stint was a lap shorter than us. So um, he's got that advantage um, going for him. I think Prost right now, he's he's pulling away a little gap, but then he can manage. Then he can, I think he can really work on managing that gap after that. And he's, he is in, in, in the driver's seat here. There is our race leader then, Nico Prost with 11 laps to go here in Beijing, 15 out of 25. Frank Montani flashing through, so the order is Nico Prost in the lead for Edam. Second is Nick Heidfeld for Venturi. Third is Lucas Degrassi for the Virgin team, uh, sorry, the App team. Fourth is Frank Montani, and look at this, we're on board with Nelson Piquet Jr. right up behind Charles Peak as they come through the narrowest point on the circuit, down towards the left-hander of 14, and uh, Piquet is looking keen to get past. Isn't it great to see the cars sliding around? Yeah. It's really entertaining to watch these cars on the circuit. A real challenge to deal with these not particularly grippy street circuits. Not much aero, harder tyres. Look at the amount of speed PK carries through compared to Charles Peak as they head out now onto the straight towards turn 19. They're running in similar uh, speed mappings. That's the interesting thing that you can tell that. Oh, bit of a front left lock up there from. PK, but you can tell that because when they're in a straight, if they're doing the same sort of speed, they're running a, a similar sort of engine mapping. He's just turned it up, I think. <laughs> Probably just listening to you there, he just, he just got on it. He's thought, I've had enough of this. I'm going to have a, have a go at getting by this guy. Into the final corner. When he gets that close, he really, from the, drive, the, the driver's seat, cannot see how close he is. So it's, it's, it's a, there's a bit of judgment going on there. There's a bit of closing your eyes too, until the, <laughs> waiting until there's a little tap to the car in front. There's Sebastian Buemi just moving out of the way of uh, the battle for the lead that's coming past him because he's down in 16th place. He has set the fastest lap of the race, a 1 minute 45.874. What could have been? Yeah, exactly. Frustration for Sebastian Buemi. Degrassi right up behind Nick Heidfeld. Gets a bit of opposite lock coming out of the chicane. The gap is three and a half seconds to the lead of the race there. So Nico Prost is looking very strong at the moment with 10 laps to go here in Beijing to be the first ever Formula E race winner, but he's got a lot of strong competitors behind. Heitfeldt, Degrassi, Montani, Daniel Apt is fifth, Sam Bird is sixth, Chandler is seventh, Peak is eighth, ninth is PK, and tenth is Oriol Severe. A long way to go, and it's so easy to make a mistake, just a slight misjudgment. Even if you slow down, it's actually sometimes easier to make a mistake, just managing the gap, so uh, far from over. Catherine Legg has been giving a warning for track limits, which means she's going too far over the white lines at some points on the circuit. But here's the standings then. You can see Nico Prost in the lead of the race. That uh, 3% was probably taken when he came into the pits that last time around. So I imagine he has more battery than that. Second place for Nick Heidfeldt with Degrassi in third. And then Frank Montani looking pretty racy to try and get around the back of Lucas Degrassi. The impressive thing about Frank, as much as he was coming through the field, I expected him to pit a couple of laps before everybody else, yeah. but he didn't. So it says a lot about the pace of, of Frank and that Andretti car. And uh, yeah, I'd be worried if I was these two guys in front of him because he's he's on a mission. Karin Chandrak has just set the fastest final sector of anyone. And he's now just half a second behind Sam Bird in the battle over sixth position. On that 17 now of 25. Not too far to go here in Beijing. We're on board with the fourth place man, Frank Montani. Bouncing his way over those curbs. A very successful racing driver, Frank Montani. He has had four podium finishes at Le Mans. He was a factory driver for Peugeot. He had seven Formula One races actually with Super Aguri back in 2006. A double Formula Nissan champion, which was the precursor to the Formula Renault 3.5 series that we have today. And you can see he's got 71% of factory remaining. As he gets on the regen into the braking zone. He drove out on the, path. the Andretti sports car in 2008 as well, the little Acura P2 car. He drove that for a while. And that's where the relationship started with the, with the Andretti team. 
Now, here he's kind of lifting there at the end of the braking zone before he uh, before he starts to brake, before he hits the regen as well. So he's uh, he's he's trying to save a little bit whilst uh, whilst staying close to the cars in front. A drive-through penalty has been given to Michaela Ciruti for the Trulli team for a pit stop time infringement. And so that's a shame for Michaela. She's in 14th place at the moment, but that'll drop her further back in the field. The Trulli guys are just having a bad day, aren't they? Yeah. It's just not, uh, it's not been a, a nice start from testing to now, but they'll, they'll definitely regroup and figure it out. And there is Michaela Ciruti then, who, as I say, running in 14th place, will have to serve that drive-through penalty within the next couple of laps or so and it's a real shame because she's had a difficult day after that accident in free practice really put on the back foot she only had one car for the second free practice session there's Prost coming through the chicane and the, the chasing pack are closing in half a second on that last lap they took out of Nico Prost but as you say he's just sort of consolidating his advantage now I imagine I would hope so. In that position, that's certainly what I'd be doing, just managing that gap as much as you can and um, keep something for, if you need it in those last couple laps, just keep something in your pocket in case you've got to get on it and uh, and demoralise the boys, that, uh, the guys that are chasing you at the end. Frank Montanic still tucked right up behind Lucas de Grassi as we come into turn 14. You don't want Frank behind you, <laughs> closing in with a couple of laps to go, because he will be uh, he will be making a move. Trust me. And it's quite a it's quite a distinctive helmet, isn't it? I can imagine looking in your mirror and seeing that bright pink helmet coming at you, and so high up in the. I was going to say, he sits so high in the car. Anyway, you definitely see him. Uh, you definitely <laughs> see him coming along there. So close to the back of Lucas de Grassi as we come towards the final corner. So let's listen to see whether he does come off earlier than he breaks as we kept the braking zone. Okay, so that was a more swift change so that presumably means he's pushing harder as Michael Andretti watches on eight laps to go here in Beijing a look to the inside from Montani but he's still not quite close enough Nico Prost leading the way for Edam second place is Nick Heidfeld for Venturi third is Lucas Degrassi and this man that we're on board with now for Andretti is for Frank Montani it's only eight tenths of a second between Heidfeld and Degrassi, but it's also only 2.2 seconds between race leader Nico Prost and second place man Nick Heidfeld. So they're all starting to close in now on race leader Prost. That was an 8 10 swing on that lap. About to, about to get interesting here. The problem when that starts happening, if you're not mentally strong enough, you start looking in the mirrors and you start, you know, it's a vicious circle and it just keeps going down. Here you can see the time in pits and uh, 147. Uh, was the uh, time set by Nico Prost in the pit lane, which was the limit that they were set, so absolutely nailed it there, the, uh, the Edam squad. Perfection from the Edam's guys, well drilled, and uh, Jean-Paul Drio runs a tight ship there, and you can see that there. And that must be difficult for them, because they're right at the start of the pit lane, so they've got to judge it perfectly. Sebastian Buemi has been in, and he basically went out, turned it up full chat, and set the fastest lap, and has come into the pits now, so it looks as though he will, at the moment, as it stands, have the fastest uh, lap time, which will give him two points in the championship at least, but he's not going to get any more than that. No, that's all he could do. That was the maximum he could do there. So the, the quickest car there, Nick Heidfeld, 46.8, about a second behind uh, Boemi's fastest lap. This is Karun Chanduk and Sam Bird doing battle. Chanduk's been reeling him in over the past couple of laps. We go on board with the Indian coming towards turn 19. Is he feeling brave enough to look up the inside into 19? He does, but... Oh, Sam Bird's gone wide. That could give Chanduk the opportunity. Now down into the final corner of turn 20. Goes to the inside. Sam Bird's going to squeeze him. It really narrows down as we come up here towards this left-hander. But Chanduk gets through and is up into sixth place. And he, he initially going into 19, you thought, oh, he's in a bit of no-man's land. But it pressured Bird into the error. Yeah, nice, nice setup on the pass there. Especially going into turn 20. There's a bigger bump on the inside than the outside. And he did a good job to hold it all together there. And uh, there's the family looking very pleased in the pit lane. Quite right, too. With that pass, so uh, Karun Chanduk moving up into sixth position. Now here's a look at the replay again, and uh, well, let's have a look at the bumps as they come into the braking zone, Dario. Yeah, Sam was quite nice, didn't squeeze him too hard, but you see how yeah. hard that Karun hit the, hit the bumps there, uh, but didn't lock up, kept it under, under control, and... Uh, Really nice pass, well set up a couple of corners in advance there. Yeah, that was that was just after the setup had, had happened, and uh, he looked to the inside line and managed to get through as Sam Bird missed the apex 
at turn 19. So good drive this from uh, Karun Chandup. Well, while all that's going on though, they're, they're still catching. Heidfeld is catching Nicola Frost in uh, down to 1.3 seconds now. Yeah, it's getting very, very close to the lead of the race. So you can see Heidfeld's made up three positions on this lap. Uh, Heidfeld, second place. Uh, he's used 50%. Uh, Nico Prost's battery percentage, as we've seen, has been 3% since he made his pit stop. So uh, we don't believe that that one is particularly correct. But nevertheless, uh, Nick Heidfeld is right with the back of Nico Prost now as they turn into the left-hander. Karun Chanduk in clear air has just set the fastest middle sector of anyone. Uh, but he's two seconds behind Daniel Apt. But the battle for the lead of the race is very much on here in Formula E with just, well, five laps to go when they cross the line in a few seconds' time. Heidfeld looking racy. Absolutely. Psychologically, this is the worst thing that can happen. You've been leading the race all day. Second place is coming along. And if you look at the uh, look at the rear wings, I'd say the Venturi was running less downforce than the Edam's car. That's interesting. So that'll be worth keeping an eye on when they get uh, close to one another in the straight. Frank Montani there running in fourth place. I'd say Frank was running the least of any of those cars. OK, so it's worth keeping uh, an eye on, as I say, as we look at the battle for the lead of the race. Nico Prost is in the lead. And initially, all a bit of a lockup from Heidfeld as he starts to push now. But it's got to be so difficult to want to push the hardest to win the race. But you can't do it. You can't do it. You've got to use your battery properly. <laughs> well, you can push as far as your driving style, but just stay away from the power knob there because <laughs> that's going to get you in trouble. It's like the old turbo boost knobs from the yeah. from the, uh, the old Group C cars back in the day. It'll get you in trouble. And uh, there's Michaela Ciruti making her way around. Nico Prost uh, closing in then. And in fact, all of the top four are right with each other and well there was in formula one as well you used to have an overtake button didn't you that, that give you more fuel therefore more power you could only use it five times but drivers would keep using it and they'd and they'd run out of power on the final laps as we go on board again then with nick heidfeld in second position there you can see it's lucas de Grassi in third with frank montani behind in fourth spot look how that car is dancing on the brakes there on the way into the, the chicane just seven tenths of a second. Nico Prost did his uh, personal best first sector. We're looking at Oriol Sevilla going past Nelson Piquet Jr. and taking ninth place away. This is coming up into turn 19. Does Takuma Sado follow through? No, he's not quite close enough to get involved in that action. Big moment there for Piquet Jr. And he might lose out to Stefan Sarazan now. Sarazan looks at the inside line and he's got Jerome D'Ambrosio right behind as well. So I wonder if Piquet Jr. is uh, running out of power towards the end of this race because he has really had to back off. Look how much Serbia has gapped him and, and Sato as well, just in that, that couple of corners. So obviously something's, uh, something's going on there. Here comes the look from Jerome D'Ambrosio in the Dragon car. Not quite close enough to make the move on Stefan Sarazan. A drive-through penalty for Catherine Legg in the Amna Naguri car for crossing the pit exit line. But she is running in uh, 14th place at the moment, so that will maybe not lose her any positions but still four laps to go and the battle for the lead of the race is down to just half a second look at the 25 laps of racing and the top what seven cars are pretty much all in one shot 8.7 seconds covers the top seven cars at the end of this race yeah, it's closing up nicely here for the for the fans at home watching i bet prost was wishing it wasn't right now <laughs> absolutely as the action is watched in the Andretti Garage, Frank Montani running in fourth spot at the moment. Charles Pique has just done his personal best in the first sector, but he's six seconds behind Sam Bird. There's the order then on the left-hand side of the screen. Prost, Heidfeld, Degrassi, Montani, Apt, Chanuk and Bird covered by 8.7 seconds with only four laps to go. Nerves in the Venturi pit. They know they could win the first ever Formula race. And what an event it would be for Venturi, the, the team that's been co-founded by Leonardo DiCaprio, the car manufacturer that hold the electric land speed record at 307 miles an hour what a what a string to their bow it would be to win the first ever Formula E race I think all these teams have worked so hard haven't they to get here to get to this point that uh, it means it would mean a lot to any of them here and you can see how much uh, how much it does uh, I'd be interested to see Frank Montagne can make some progress here because he's, uh, he's dropped back just a wee bit fastest final sector of anyone throughout the whole race for Nick Heidfeld so he is starting to push with three laps to go. Nico Prost up in front of him. And as you say, uh, Lucas de Grassi and Frank Montani have just dropped back a little bit from these two. So maybe these two can afford to get a little bit more power in these remaining laps. We've got laps 23, 24 and 25 to go here in Beijing. Just a million dollar more. question. 
who's got the slightly more battery power left that's who's going to be able to push it because as far as the, the, the handling of the cars and the, the, the performance of the drivers are very very equal it's who's just going to be able to turn it up just a wee bit enough to make that uh, that pass or in cross case stay ahead and so the pressure as well is going to be worth looking at <laughs> there, there's pressure as uh, the father watches on alan Prost, Prost four times Formula One world champion and the Venturi guys enjoyed watching uh, Prost under pressure. I think we've, who's ever seen that before? Alain Prost looking nervous. I don't think I've ever seen that in all those years I watched him recent. Flashing through along Hu Ching Street, down towards the Kui Chong chicane. Through the left, through the right, and out again. That was close. I fell there on the, the exit wall. That was. <laughs> I think he overextended a wee bit through the middle. Just under nine tenths of a second, separating first and second place. We're about to start the penultimate lap of the race. It looks like it's going to be one of those two that will take victory. Lucas Degrassi uh, not looking great on power. Well, he's got just a bit more than his chaser, Frank Montani. He's out. right there. Yeah, he's right with him as they come out onto the start finish straight. Penultimate lap, just six tenths of a second between our race leaders here in Formula E. One of these two men is going to go down in history as the first ever all electric single seater race winner, Nico Prost or Nick Heidfeld. Now, Didn't both these guys drive for Rebellion. Yes. Yes. In the fact, were they not teammates not this teammates. year when they won in LMP2? They might be. At Le Mans. So they know each other very well. They know their driving styles very well that could come into play here in a wee minute we'll see what happens out they come towards the chicanes again on national stadium road the south national stadium road and i felt starting to push isn't he a bit of a bounce there nico frost knows it because he's just gone purple in the first sector which means he's fastest of anyone takuma sato has just set the fastest lap of the race so sato might be in line to pick up those two points for fastest lap but if the sun begins to set here in Beijing, the sun will set on one of these two drivers as the winner of the Formula E race. Oh, Buemi's day goes from bad to worse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nothing more that uh, Sebastian Buemi can do. He is in the pits and out of the race, but his teammate Nico Prost has the chance to take victory for the EDAMS team. Out through the chicane again towards 19. We've only got one lap to go. He's going to try and set him up, isn't he? If, if you're Heidfeld, you're going to have to set him up and gradually gain on him through about three or four corners, probably trying to get him, maybe even in the last corner. It might come down to the last corner of the last lap. You're setting him up the whole rest of the lap just to get close enough. Down towards the final corner they come as we get ready to go for the penultimate lap. A lock-up on the left front from Heidfeld as he starts to push again. Well, I say starts to push. He's been pushing the whole race, but across the line they come. Is there any difference in the gap between them? No, still just six tenths of a second. The Chinese fans have got all their smartphones and tablets at the ready to picture the moment that the first Formula E race is won here in Beijing. If he's going to do a move, he's got to start getting closer just at this point of the lap. Coming out, probably actually out of the turn 13 chicane is when that move is, is going to really start sort of building. The cars are so close together, you can't just, uh, you know, in terms of performance, you can't yeah. jump on them. You're going to have to build up to that move. Through the left-hander of six. Prost was on the limit. Did you see the rear slide in there from mid to exit through that two, th turn six? Really pushing hard, and these two guys have done a very good job of managing their battery. The fact that they've still got this sort of pace, whereas the likes of Degrassi and Montani and Daniel Apt are all dropping back a little bit. But here we go, out through towards turn 14. There's only three corners to go. Three corners separate Nico Prost and victory. Into the left-hander he comes now. All very neat and tidy, and Heidfeld's got to push. They've done a brilliant job, these two, keeping the momentum up better than the other guys, using the, the momentum rather than using more battery power. In that, uh, you know, conserving energy is one thing, but they've been driving the hell out of the cars all day. Through the chicane. Two more corners to go now in the FIA Formula E race here in Beijing. There's still just six tenths of a second between first and second, but it looks as though Nico Prost may just have enough. He comes through turn 19, one turn to go. Heidfeld's closing in as they come towards the final corner at turn 20. Is Heidfeld going to fancy a look into He's the last closing. corner of the race? Heidfeld goes to the inside line oh. and they make contact and they're both off. And that's an accident for Nick Heidfeld. 
he has gone off the circuit. The two of them come together in the final corner, which means Lucas de Grassi is going to take victory in the FIA Formula E race here in Beijing. A dramatic, dramatic end to the race as Nick Heidfeld is pitched into the air after contact with Nico Prost. The Venturi team watching on, and what a dramatic end as the cars come across the line. Frank Montani finishing in second for Andretti. It's third for Daniel Apt, fourth for Sam Bird, fifth for Charles Peak. But a shake of the head from Alain Prost. There is Nico Prost out of the car. And he goes as if to say, what happened there? Takuma Sato set the fastest lap of the race, and there is Nick Heidfeld clambering out of his Venturi car. It's good to see. It's a fantastic to see Nick Heidfeld climbing out. Not really the test we wanted, and I think we might have a bit of a uh, conversation here between these two. And Nick Heidfeld not impressed with that. Love but to see that again, because they, they got alongside, and then <laughs> there was a big swerve one, in one direction or the other. Love to see a replay to see... Uh, which Didn't, one swerved yeah. at which there, because that was uh, it was a great build-up to the move that we talked it about. It was all coming, wasn't it? It was all... Well, we got a climax here, but the victory was uh, Lucas de Grassi, who was many people's favourite for victory, probably not on the... Uh, was, he your, was he your pick? I picked him after qualifying, didn't yes, I? Yes, you did, actually, so God. fair enough. Credit where credit's due. And so a dramatic end to the Formula E race here in Beijing. Here we go. This is on board, coming down towards the final corner. Heidfeld goes to the inside, and I mean, yeah, I mean that's a. Uh, yeah, that's. A, oh. <laughs> I mean, we didn't. Ideally, we didn't want to put the uh, crash structures on these Formula E cars to the test, but we have done. But I think there's there's very little debate about what happened there. Yeah, he Prost just swerved in, which is a real it's a real shame. He drove a perfect race up until that point. Um, and Vlad Heidfeld's okay. That's a little bit too familiar for me. That going up into the <laughs> into the fence business there. But um, th when it, when a car gets airborne like that, there's more luck involved than anything. And to see both drivers come back is, is yeah. uh, really good to see that. So uh, great job by Degrassi. <laughs> yeah, Lucas Degrassi is the race winner here in the FIA Formula E Championship, the first ever race in Beijing. Frank Montani uh, is in second place, so he got past. Uh, no, he was always in front of Daniel Apt in the closing stages, wasn't he? So he finishes in second. The Venturi guy is coming to speak to Nick Heidfeld, who understandably is furious. And there's Nico Prost walking back a, a little a little sheepish. Uh, so we may hear from them, but we'll certainly hear from our race winner, Lucas de Grassi, when he gets back to the pits. Third for Daniel Apt, then fourth for Sam Bird, fifth for Charles Peake, uh, sixth for Karun Chanduk. And there is the real wreckage of the of the Venturi car. Good day for the uh, Andretti guys and of course the Abt guys. Both, both cars finishing up there in, in the, their cases. So there's the story of the race and uh, Nico Prost looking very disheartened and well, interesting to uh, hear both of their sides of the story well i think Heidfeld's side of the story we probably don't we probably don't need to hear the one of fury oh yeah from the in car it's clear isn't it let's watch again from outside in case he checks to the right he's not there no i mean that's just silly i mean i, I do try to uh stay impartial at times but those curbs just sent that car in there we've got to rethink that because that happened at the uh, spa, spa as well with the gp3 car we've got to rethink these sausage curbs and here we go again into the final corner and from Prost's point of view, what was you, you know, do you just cover the inside line here? Is that is that all you can do? <laughs> You're thinking, oh no, here it comes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's happened to me the last lap of the 500 a couple of years ago with Sato, but yeah, he just drove at him. Yeah, yeah not good. It's so the shape. Sometimes you've just, you've been passed and you've got to accept yeah. it. You know, you do your best to not be passed, but what can, what can you do? I was real worried about Heidfeld there. Yeah, yeah. So good, good to see Nick climbing out of the car and Alan Prost with his head in his hands as, well, it looked like he put his head in his hands as soon as the contact was made and yeah. didn't sort of watch the uh, the rest of the accident by the looks of things. Great safety there from the from the car. But there is our race winner, Lucas de Grassi for the Audi Sport apt Formula E team. He takes victory and uh, in the first ever FIA Formula E race, it's the Brazilian, Lucas de Grassi, who is victorious, superb performance.
from him. Second in GP2 back in 2007, got his F1 break in 2010, where he raced 18 times with Virgin. He was second at Le Mans this year for the Audi team, as they now go through to get weighed, and the uh, podium procedure will take place. <laughs> Frank making jokes on the way in. Still. <laughs> Does he take it? He takes his racing seriously, I presume, Frank. He oh, doesn't seem to take anything else seriously. I think nothing else, but when he puts the helmet on, it's all business. Up until that point, you've got to look out. So the marshals roll over Nick Heidfeldt's car. So we can now hear from the winner of the first ever E Prix, Lucas Degrassi. Lucas Degrassi, you have put everything you've learned over the past few months into practice. Congratulations, you are the winner. How does it feel? It feels great to be the first winner in Formula E. Although I have to say, uh, the accident in the last corner is something that nobody wants. Nobody wants to win this way. Our strategy was not the best strategy. We lost a position. We were not able to get it back. Uh, but that's racing. I'm very glad that Heidfeld is okay and the car proved to be very safe, first of all. But I'm very happy to, to get this win home. Excellent. Congratulations to you and the team. Thank you. A true gent as well, Lucas Degrassi. You know, he comes out and he says, we didn't do the best job. It's not a shame we won, but, you know, probably not as deserved. But you, you take him whatever happens. Oh, yeah, because you're going to lose races like that too. <laughs> Let's hear now from Frank Montani for Andretti, our second place driver. He's with Nicky. <laughs> Frank Montani, congratulations, second place. And you were on the tail of Luce, Lucas Degrassi the entire time. Yeah, How does it feel? Yeah, it's good to be on the tail. It's better to be on the front, but... Uh... Still happy for the for the guys. Uh, it's good results because it's good uh, good end of the day. Well, the beginning was good too, so it's a good day, you know. To be honest, I was just afraid about the guy, but as soon as uh, my mechanic said uh, the two of them are okay, because I saw them flying quite uh, quite strongly, so they are okay. That's the most important. Race uh, was good. It's a good first event. Very happy. Very proud of the Formula E things. So well done, guys. And uh, obviously, you started from eighth, so some good overtaking skills to get up to second. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> That's not too bad, yeah. It's okay. Thanks very much, well done. Frank, I, Frank is a broadcaster for Canal Plus in France. He goes to all the Formula One races, doing interviews, interviewing drivers, but he doesn't behave in any way near the, the way he knows we want him to be. He's a, he's a bright Frank. nuisance, isn't he? But he's brilliant. I mean, we, we've talked about him, we love him, he's great. Let's hear now from Daniel Apt, a 1-3 on the podium for Apt. Let's go down, he's with Nicky. Uh, Daniel, oh, he's wandering off. Let's see if we can get a very quick word. We can walk to you to the podium. Daniel, is your dad proud? I don't know, I just heard that something's wrong, so... Uh... Right, okay, we'll find out what that is and uh, let you know as soon as we know. Okay, so uh, Daniel Apt not particularly in a, in a mood to have a chat there for the time being, a couple of shrugs of the shoulders. Uh, Maybe a technical issue, I don't know. Yeah, may, uh, nothing is coming up on uh, the timing screens. The incident involving Nick Heidfeld and Nico Prost is unsurprisingly under investigation. But we'll, we'll wait and see what, what comes of all that. But uh, certainly Lucas de Grandstee, after 25 laps of racing here at the first ever Ypres, is the victor. And uh, as we said, many people's favourites. Great to see Andretti there in second place, a team that really know what they're doing and a driver that is really strong as well in Frank Montani. Here's a look at the results then after the first ever FIA Formula E race. Lucas Degrassi takes victory and the 25 points that comes with it, finishing three seconds clear of Frank Montani in second place. Third for Daniel Apt in the uh, Audi Sport app team as well, so a 1-3 for them. Sam Bird finishing fourth for Virgin Racing, uh, a good drive from him after he didn't have the best of qualifying sessions. A fifth place for Charles Peak, so a 2-5 for Andretti. Kroon Chandler finishing in sixth place for Mahindra. Seventh and eighth for the two Dragon Racing cars of Jerome D'Ambrosio and Oriol Servia. And Nelson Piquet Jr. finishing in ninth. And Stefan Sarazan picking up the final point, having started down in 19th place on the grid. Jaime Aguishwari, 11th. Uh, Nico Prost and Nick Heidfeld both uh, classified finishers, uh, but as one lap down, but they ended up in, in all sorts of trouble at that final corner. Catherine Legg finishing 14th, Michele Ciruti finishing in 15th, hoping Tongue had to start from the pit lane. Uh, we saw Sato retire, Buemi was out of the race as well, Jano Trulli and Bruno Senna both eliminated on the first lap of the E Prix.
Well, what a thrilling first ever Formula E race. What an end to it as well. I'm sure there'll be plenty of fallout to come. Uh, Jan Mardenborough and Kyle will also be talking us through everything that happened and we'll cross back to Beijing for the first ever Formula E podium. So join us in just a few minutes. Well, did we ever expect such drama, especially in the last lap? Well, last turn incident between Nick Heidfeld and the race leader at the time, Nico Prost, and you can see the angry reaction, but it left the way open for Lucas de Grassi to claim the first ever Formula E race win, and very happy he was too. Unsurprisingly, we will hear from him in just a moment's time as we head back over to Beijing and uh, find out exactly what happened. And as we heard a little bit earlier on from Nikki Shields, our pit lane reporter, Daniel Abd did finish in third place, but for reasons unknown to us quite yet, he's been demoted, and that means Sam Bird, our British Virgin Racing team member, has been promoted to third place, so is on the podium, and it's time for the champagne. So so let's cross over to Jack Nichols and Dario Franchitti in Beijing. It looked like almost out onto the podium were, were coming the drivers. They'll be coming out in a few moments. Here we go then. So a wave and onto the third step of the podium is Sam Bird. So there is some issue with Daniel Apt. Sam Bird has been classified in third. Second place for Frank Montani and the race winner, Lucas de Grassi taking victory in the first ever FIA Formula E race here in Beijing. Handshakes all around. And on the top step of the podium for Lucas de Grassi, it'll be the Brazilian national anthem. Very interesting to find out what happened to Daniel Lapp there in third place, but uh, he seemed to know that something was going on. But here's the Brazilian national anthem for Lucas de Grassi. So the Brazilian national anthem for Lucas de Grassi, the German national anthem for the APT team. They are the two men that have conquered electric racing for the first time here in Beijing. There's Frank Montani in second place. And that's not a bad podium, uh, not a bad trophy there for it's Lucas. Not a bad trophy, is it? That one will look good in the uh, little trophy cabinet. So Lucas de Grassi on the top step of the podium here in Beijing. He, Frank Montani and Sam Bird finishing in the top three positions. The battle was intense for the lead of the race. Nico Prost and Nick Heidfeld came together at the final corner with an absolutely huge accident. Luckily, they both managed to walk away. It's Lucas de Grassi who wins the first ever FIA Formula E race. From myself, Jack Nichols, Dario Franchitti alongside me, Nicky Shields in the pits. We'll see you at the next round in Malaysia, Putrajaya in November. Excellent stuff. It's nice to see the podium coming to fruition and what a race. I mean, we were sitting here as it was, uh, you know, going through its paces, going, oh, that's good, that's interesting, that's exciting. Then all of a sudden, yeah. last lap, last corner, boom! Doesn't matter what happened in the rest of Certainly it. That is going to be the thing that's remembered from the very first Formula E race. I mean, Nico Prost and, and Nick, Nick Heinfeld, Heinfeld coming yeah. together. I mean, what, what were yeah, they it's thinking? A it's, it's a shame it happened right at the very end there. Um, I think, well, he, you saw him look right. I didn't see him look left. I don't know what you saw. But. For me, Nico going down the street, he's, a, he's sort of half defending in the middle of the road, going into the last corner. He knows that Heidfeld's been teeing him up to, to make a move. And, uh, yeah, it's a rash move. Nico looks, Prost looks, looks to the right before 
it's a horrible corner. accident, is it? It's one yeah. of those really nasty ones. We were saying that, um, and Jack also picked up in commentary, that um, we saw a very similar incident in Spa in a GP3 race that you were actually competing in. And it's the, the curbs, they launch the car almost, don't they? Yeah, so at Spa, at the last chicane, we have these curbs called sausage curbs, and they're quite they're raised uh, sausages, really. And um, yeah, a car was on the grass and hit, the, hit those curbs sideways, got launched up into the air, a very similar uh, incident to, to Heidfeld. Look at the adrenaline. The, that is yeah. total adrenaline, isn't it? Yeah, you're running on adrenaline, adrenaline at that point. It's, uh, you don't feel pain. You just want to get out of the car and uh, get to safety. I think Heidfeld did a, a good decision, didn't he, not to take his helmet off at that moment in time. I mean, Prost takes his helmet off, but Nico keeps his on. Is that sensible? <laughs> Well, hopefully it wouldn't get to that point. They've raced together in the past. Um, they're obviously good friends. And they're teammates. The, yeah, they I are I mean, it's amazing. Exactly. And it's, well, the first thing is just to say how safe the cars are, and it's really important that he's walked away from it. Uh, we've seen quite a few horrific accidents recently, and uh, driver safety is really, really paramount. So it's good he's walked away from that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm just hearing, actually, we can update you. Uh, Daniel Apt failed to go through a drive through penalty, which is why he was slightly demoted. He did take third place, but uh, demoted to 10th place. So it was Sam Bird, the, uh, the young Brit, that once again had success on the street circuit to take third. So Lucas Degrassi winning. Uh, then in second place, Frank Montagny. And in third place, it was Sam Bird. Let's uh, just go back to that crash, because... Um, who was at fault? Who was the person that should have stopped that from happening? Prost. Yeah. Without doubt. Because he's, he's half defending down the straight in the middle of the road. He knows that Heidfeld is looking to overtake him. And um, you can see just before, just before uh, Prost turns left, he looks to the right and he doesn't know where he is. And at this point, he's like, OK, I need, to, I need to defend now somehow. I don't know where he is. I don't know where Heidfeld is. And it's a rash move. It's, uh, it's a crazy move to do. What goes have, through yeah. your mind as a driver when you're in that situation and you're seeing, and, you know, he, could, he would know straight away, wouldn't he, that that's his fault. So what goes through your mind as a driver or do you belligerently say, it wasn't me? Yeah, you, uh, <laughs> a driver's state of mind after an incident like that, you never think you're in the wrong. Unless you, you go out to the garage and you watch the, the video over and then you sort of understand and, um, what happened exactly, seeing it live. Um, but during an incident or after an incident, a driver always thinks that they're in the right. I mean, we always hear, don't we, motorsport is dangerous. It's on the back of every ticket, also on the back of every lanyard. But as you said, it's tantamount to see how safe those cars are, that he can get up and walk away. I'm sure he'll have to get checked over at the medical centre after an incident like that, surely. Yeah, a brief check over normal, that I'd expect. Um, but I think, yeah, he looks OK. He, he, he looks like he's uh, walking and not limp, limping at all. And the, so that's good. the work to the car as well. I mean, yes, they've got a fair amount of time <laughs> to do it, but this is all new technology. So how hard is it for the team now to pick up the pieces and put it back together? Well, it just depends on how bad the damage is. It uh, depends if they've uh, damaged the, the monocoque, which is the main survival cell, which the driver sits in. That's what keeps him safe. Um, depends if they've done damage to the batteries. I mean, the gearbox obviously looks in a very bad way. Um, so, yeah, they've got quite a lot of work to do to that. It just depends completely if it's a new monocoque as well, which is Yeah, because we were, we were actually chatting, weren't we, earlier, saying that the teams can't work on the cars in between. It's not like they come back to the base, which is Donington, mm. um, in between races. So they'll go on to Putrajaya and Malaysia. They won't really be used until uh, November the 22nd, I think it is. So it's a long time to wait. So what does the team have to do? Do they just have to look at it? work out what they need and replace everything and then off they go. Well, yeah, it could work both ways, sorry. It could well, work both ways. They might um, have to order all the parts now to then ship out to get ready if the parts are even available. It, with it being such a new series, I don't know how many sp spares they've got available at the moment. So. Well, they're lucky to have such a big break to the next That's round right. in Singapore. Yeah. Otherwise, if it was a, say, a race uh, back to back, they'll be, they'll be struggling to uh, get parts or just fix, fix the car and get it ready for the next round. We know, we know the whole thing about Formula E is that it's going to be around 10 of the most iconic cities in the world, which means it's always going to be a tight circuit. Is this the sort of race that we can expect to see with, with contact, with you know, a high adrenaline rate, with a high attrition rate? Well, I hope not to see contact. I mean, hopefully not moves like that, because that was a very, very a crazy move for me anyway, just to watch it, and uh, it's a pretty, pretty scary move to do. But uh, the start of the race for me was fantastic. It was a lot of uh, argy-bargy and uh, close moves and, uh, yeah, teammates sort of rubbing, and, yeah, it was pretty exciting. So uh, hopefully you can see the same in Singapore. Anything else that surprised you? Frank's move on, um, Frank, Frank Montagne's Montagne, move, yeah. move on, he's on his teammate Charles Pick. That was uh, pretty interesting on the first lap when we was putting the uh, teammate into the wall. So 
that was pretty interesting. But for me, he was uh, the most exciting driver, I think, uh, in the race, which was, he was very fun to, to watch. I mean, overtake yeah. after overtake, wasn't it, for him? Yeah, there were quite a few overtakes. And the only thing I'd like to say as well is it's just surprised with uh, the result that EDAMs have had. Um, they look very, very strong coming into the event. Um, they've had a bad result with, well, both drivers not finishing the race. Um, Prost, unfortunately, maybe his own fault, but um, that's certainly not the result they wanted when they came to the first race. I mean, Marco Andretti uh, was, was there watching on, uh, and Andretti will be very happy, I think, with that result. And, and Frank, maybe, you know, I bump into him in the pit lane all the time, uh, as, and he's the technical correspondent for Canal Plus, the French TV channel. It's a very different thing to get back in a race car and race, but he's proved that he's worth that seat, isn't he? Certainly, he's worked at a very, very high level. He's done um, Le Mans, he's done all sorts of racing, and he's a very talented driver. And it's nice to have a character in the, in the sport as well. You can see him joking around, which is always nice. Yeah, and Lucas Degrassi, you tipped him for the win at the beginning of the show. <laughs> we don't like to rub it in that you were right, but you were right. <laughs> and, you know, it was a fortunate win for him, I suppose. He was only due to get third place, but that crash between the two Knicks uh, left yeah. the door open for him. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, it's, it's a shame for those two guys, but fantastic result for Lucas. Um, I knew he was going to do well, um, but, yeah, not quite the way I'd expected him to have won. But there you go. It's good to see him on the top step. Yeah, he'll be a very happy man. I'm sure he will celebrate and paint the Beijing <laughs> town red. Uh, plenty more analysis to come on the way, so make sure you rejoin us. We'll be back in just a few moments. So the very first Formula E race has taken place. 25 laps around the bird nest in Beijing. And our race winner, Lucas Degrassi for Audi Sports at. Congratulations to him. Almost handed the win by that last lap crash of Nick Heidfeld and Nico Prost. In second place, Frank Montagny for Andretti. Congratulations to him. And Sam Bird in third place for Virgin Racing. We're hoping to catch up with Sam before the end of the programme. Fingers crossed we can. But apologies uh, to you if uh, we don't manage to. We just uh, had to cut away from him at the last moment to hand to the world feed. So apologies for that. And to any of you who are thinking music during a race, uh, we also apologise for that. That's another world feed the issue. But this is the start of a brand new championship. So plenty of time to uh, have a little look around and improve on things and change things around. So let's have a look at uh, the rest of the classifications. Uh, Jaime Alguaswari in 11th place and that accident between Prost and Heidfeld leaves them uh, categorised in 12th and 13th. And we have uh, four drivers not classified. So Sato, Buemi, Truly and Senna are the four drivers not classified. A pretty bad day for Senna. We will talk about that in just a moment's time. But back in the studio uh, here with Kyle and with Jan. Uh, we have to really talk about this pit lane and the idea of changing cars. The battery won't last for the whole race. So they came up with the idea of changing cars. So the driver has to leap from one to another. But in practice, Kyle, it's not working to the advantage of those who might be fastest. Just explain why not. Yeah, well, to, to make it a safe... Uh, sort of procedure, they've decided to have a minimum time that the car must be stopped in, in the pits. So what that does is it allows time for the crew to, to make sure the driver's buckled in safely and the transition's made properly. So as a result, if you're really fast, you're actually just being held there at the end, waiting for that time. So 50 so, seconds that they're held for mandatory? Yeah, it's the same for all drivers. There's no particular disadvantage. It just means if you're particularly fast, you can't make an advantage And Sam Bird here, he stayed out on a different strategy, um, thinking he'd make the most of the track time and space, and then decided, you know, he had an amazing change, yes. like Frankie Dettori. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it wasn't quite enough, uh, because obviously he was then held within the pit stop for the duration of the 50 seconds. Yeah, I was surprised, actually, he didn't make more of the, the clean track. I thought that might have helped him a little bit and get a bit of a jump on the other drivers, but he came out behind. Um, Nick Heidfeld did quite well, um, started fifth, came out in second and was running really well. So I was really impressed with his, his performance in the race right till the very end, unfortunately, where it all went wrong. Well, it's funny you mention him because he is in Beijing and he is currently speaking to Nicky Shields. Nick Heidfeld, you were on for a podium finish, but unfortunately we had a very dramatic end. Um, most importantly, are you OK? Yeah, that's the most important thing. But actually, while I was still upside down in the car, I was complaining 
on the radio. I was putting my thumbs up. I was surprised that it didn't hurt more, to, to be honest. Um, and uh, I think I was up for a win and not for a podium, so it's very, very disappointing. Would have been a fantastic race, qualifying P6, starting P5, P4 after the first corner. Great job by the guys on the pit stop, P2, and then saved a lot of energy. I've had everything left. I think placed it perfectly for the last corner, and um, I guess the TV pictures show quite clearly that I was alongside him and uh, Nico pulled into me and nothing, nothing I could do. Just happy that Formula, Formula E and everybody gives us such a safe um, car and uh, a relatively safe street circuit with, with the barriers they, they put. But uh, you see, I can smile, but it's so disappointing, it's so, so disappointing not to take a win away from here. Well, we're pleased to see that you are okay. Obviously, you are very disappointed, but let's talk about the race up until that point. Fantastic, some real wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. Yeah, it was great. Uh, we did some simulations in Donington, but it's never quite the real thing until you do it. The excitement all builds up, I hope, and I uh, guess the, the fans all enjoyed it. Um, we had problems with the radio communication. I guess it was the same for most of the teams, but uh, yeah, for all the first stint, I didn't have any radio. And um, it worked better than I expected with saving the energy and fighting at the same same time. It was it was very enjoyable until the last corner. Well, thank you ever so much, and uh, we hope you're all right. I've got a funny feeling Nick Heidfeld did his best to be politically correct there and not just go. I'm gonna go at him, but I mean, it must be so hard to hide that emotion when you stood there with the world's press and you know all the fans waiting to hear what you've got to say. Jan, is it difficult? Yeah, you have to put on a forced smile. Uh, you have to. It's part of your job. You have to be able to talk in front of the camera and uh, explain what happens. But uh, yeah, I can really feel for for Heidfeld talking there. You could hear banging in the background, couldn't you? I just wonder if that was one of the team <laughs> engineers just going, I'm going to get this car and having a right wallop of it. Because, I mean, it's not just the driver, is it? The whole team have put hours into this first race to have it blown away like that. Yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough for the, the crew. They're the ones that are spending all the hours working on the cars. They're the ones that are there first in the morning, working till late at night. And, well, they've got a big, big job on their hands again now, unfortunately. Um, they've done very well, they've prepared well, um, they've looked okay in testing. Um, Nick's obviously, Nick Heidfeld's obviously done very well in the race, managing the engine, uh, the energy power, and uh, saving it right till the end. He had a fantastic move right at the very end there to go side by side, and unfortunately it didn't work out. Yeah, it certainly didn't. Well, how, uh, how good was Nico Prost at hiding his disappointment with what happened? Uh, Jack Nichols has managed to escape from the commentary box and caught up with him. Here with Nico Prost, uh, the pole man who led for the majority of the race and, until that final corner, Nico. Uh, we'll start off with uh, the race. You, you drove very well and, and looked in control. Yes, looked in control until the last... <laughs> I couldn't work out. I was very disappointed, to be honest. I, I just... I don't know what he tried, to be honest. I didn't see him. Then I tried to let him through, but it was too late. He hit my front left. I think with the speed he had, there was no chance, you know, he would make the corner, but it's very disappointing because I think I did a very good job today and to see this victory going away in the last corner is, is very, very hard. So did you looked and thought he was sort of on your outside and tried to give him the room out there? No, I just, you know, it was the last corner. I see him was pretty far, so I just break in the middle thinking, you know, he's not going to try anything stupid, but he tried suicide uh, jump, you know, and then I tried to move to the right, but he already hit my wheel and uh, it was too late. So you didn't really see him coming at all? No, I didn't think he would try something like this, you know, so I, I, I was starting to turn in and then, you know, I saw him, so I tried to move over, but he clipped my front wheel and he broke my wheel and then went flying over. I mean, it's good he has nothing because he's a friend, but I'm very disappointed. Did you expect more? Uh, from such an experienced driver with all his Formula One racing experience? Yes, I didn't. I mean, if you look at the last corner, there's no chance you're going to overtake on the inside. So I really did not expect him to try here. It must be difficult to, to think of now, but you had great pace today. Both you and Sebastian have been strong all weekend, and that must give you hope for the, for the future of the championship. Yeah, I mean, it's good. You, we were on pole and leading, but, you know, at the moment, all I can think about is just that I lost the victory of race one of Formula E, so it's very hard. Thank you. Thank you. The word I would use right now is incredulous, both of you. What do you think? I'm quite surprised, really, with the comments that Prost has just come up with, really. Um, he, he said that Heidfeld hit him, um, which we didn't seem to think that at all. And, uh, yeah, he said 
some various other things as well. But I'm quite surprised, really. He's a very talented driver and he's races at a high level, but he's clearly in the wrong, I think. Yeah, he said that he wouldn't expect a driver to come up on his inside. And surely that's the place where you're going to expect a driver to come and try and overtake you, especially when you're uh, power limited. And you can see where he, he actually had the boost on him then. And that's well before the turning point. That was a block when the car's beside you and it's too late then. It's just a rash move, really. It's, it's just. A yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't agree with you and Nico Frost there. I've got a funny feeling that uh, Heidfeld will regret maybe being quite so uh, gentlemanly about that whole situation. Uh, make sure you join us in a few moments' time. We still have plenty more to come for you as we discuss, deliberate, deliberate and cogitate over exactly what's happened in this race. That's all to come after this break. Welcome back. Well, a dramatic day, but don't forget to tune in for the live coverage of round two at the Formula E Championship. We'll be bringing you all the action live from Putrajaya in Malaysia. Coverage starts from 7 a.m. even earlier, so set your alarm clock on the 22nd of November live here on ITV4. Now, we've already held a little bit from Nick Heidfeld, but we didn't really want to leave it there. So we sent Nicky Shields back into the den to ask him some more questions. Okay, thank you. Nick, just one last question. Have you spoken to Nico Prost since the accident? Yeah, we spoke after the accident. As usual with drivers, he has a different opinion. He thought it was my mistake. Maybe when he watches uh, the videotape, he uh, changes his mind. Maybe not. Um, I'm not mad at him. Things like this happen. He's a friend of mine. We drive together in the same car, in sports cars, and, uh, yeah, unfortunate. Do you think it's anything to do with his lack of experience compared to your experience? No, I don't think it's, it's lack of, of experience. I mean, he did a great job all weekend. He was on pole position. He was leading the race till the last lap on the last corner, and you don't want to lose it there. Uh, I guess he didn't expect me to, to do it there. He told me uh, afterwards he wouldn't think that it's possible to overtake and make the last corner, but I'm sure it is. <laughs> it would have been possible. And uh, no, it's, it's not that. It's, it's racing. Thanks very much, Nick. It's racing. He said, I'm not mad at him, but more strong words really after that incident. I'm surprised he managed to bite his tongue as well as that. Um, obviously, they're, they're driving together, but still, that's... Yeah, very good of him to put it that way. I, I wouldn't have put it down to racing in that respect. What do you have to do, Carl, as a race engineer, to prepare your driver for the next time they go out on circuit? Will they be able to bury the hatchet? I, I know friends who would say just lock them in the back of a van and let them fight it out, but what, what would you do? Well, that's a tough one. Um, they're both going to have to be professionals about it. They're paid racing drivers. It's their jobs. They need to take it seriously. And from the next round, whether it's with Formula E or whether they're racing other cars together, um, they need to put it behind them and, and move on. And uh, I think they'll be able to do that. You any good at that, Jan Mardenborough? Well, hopefully I haven't had many shunts like that with my with my uh, with other drivers. But, Too good uh, for that. <laughs> <laughs> it does happen. And uh, Heidfeld was, uh, was a really good guy there, sort of saying... He accepts that it's the last lap, and um, yeah, he seems very, very calm and uh, the, mo the the perfect racing driver, really, perfect mm -hmm. answer yeah. to give. And yeah, it, it's true, it's, it is racing, and it's stuff like that does happen that you have to talk about it and, uh, and move on to the next round. Leonardo DiCaprio will be a very happy man, I think, that he's managed to control his driver and his team. Um, I want to know, we know that Senna didn't have the greatest of days, neither did Buemi, but who was your driver of the day? It was going to be Prost. Oops. Considering how he's how he led the race and how he controlled it, because um, it's the first ever Formula E race, so you don't know how long your energy is going to last if you've gone too if you bolted too quick and you run out of of energy. But uh, he seemed to control the whole race, and it's just unfortunate at the end. But uh, Frank Montani was uh, was was very good as well. He's a very aggressive driver. His overtakes were pretty exciting to watch, and um, yeah, I think it would be it would be him. And yeah. Carl? Well, I think Nick Heifel did a very good job. He, uh, he was there and thereabouts. He had a good uh, car swap halfway through the race, jumped a couple of places there, which was key to his running in second place. So that nearly gave him the win. It didn't happen, so he did very, very well. Uh, obviously, I'm particularly proud of uh, Lucas de Grassi for, for taking the win. Unfortunately, in those circumstances, not the, not the best. But, um, yeah, like you say, unfortunate for some of the guys that didn't have quite a good result that they were expecting. Well, things are certainly going to hot up next time as we head to Malaysia and Putrajaya. What are your expectations for the second Formula E race? Well, I think uh, the two teams that are really strong is Apt and uh, Edams. They've shown their, their strength here already. 
Um, but there's lots of other teams as well. Sam Bird did very well in the race, uh, considering where he started, and uh, he finished uh, well, second, I think. So third in the end, yeah, yeah he got third. promoted, position. didn't he? Yeah. So um, I think he started 11th at the start of the race, and uh, to finish where he did, he uh, shows he had very good race pace, and uh, he's a very good driver as well. Yeah, Virgin definitely aren't to be discounted. And again, the Venturi guys as well. They've got good experience with uh, electric vehicles, and uh, I guess they bring that, some of that knowledge across onto, onto the racetrack as well, which is good to see. And Senna really needs to try a little bit harder next time. A little silly mistake, wasn't it? Well, he had a tough weekend in general, really. He didn't have much running in practice and in qualifying. Uh, they had an issue, so he didn't actually get to qualify. Um, and then at the start of the race, I mean, he got either pushed onto a kerb and then hit into one of, uh, into Sato, I think it was, and broke his suspension. So not the ideal weekend for your first ever Formula E race, but uh, yeah, okay. he'll be back. All right, well, join us at 6 p.m. tonight for highlights of today's first ever Formula E race, where we'll have more reaction from Beijing. And there's plenty of other sports to look forward to here on IT before as well. Tune in to stage seven of the Tour of Britain. Coverage starts at 1 p.m. today. It's also the penultimate stage of La Vuelta a España. Highlights at 7 p.m. tonight. And mark your cards for round 13 of the MotoGP in San Marino. Uh, we have highlights for you on Monday at 8 p.m. Tune in to see if Mark Marquez can keep his lead. 12 out of 13 races so far. And our next live motorsport comes from Silverstone. Join us for round nine of the British Touring Car Championship, 28th of September from 11. My thanks to both you, Carl, and also to Jan. And we will see you next time for more Formula E. Bye.